What's up everybody? Welcome back to another video by Pyrrhic Victoria. I'm Pyrrhic and I'm Victoria and this is the eighth installment of our Laura Olympus analysis video series where we cover now we're at five chapters <laughs> in three hours, something like that. That's, What's going on? That's the going rate these days. Uh, we're not going to put a number on it, but uh, we're going to continue the discussion today and continue going over the details in agonizing detail um, of the series. And so I believe the last video, part seven, left with episode 130. And yes. now we're going to start this video with 131. Uh, just really quickly before we get into it, just want to express our gratitude for everybody checking in, leaving really interesting comments. At the time of filming this video, we had just uploaded uh, part six of the video series, yep. and you guys are coming in with really great contributions. I saw a couple people commenting about ways they would have drawn certain panels, things that they wished uh, would have been explored in like the pawn shop scene. So really great comments, and we like seeing that kind of stuff. And that's like the merit of these videos. Um, Victoria always says... It's easy to just hate on something and just trash it and just make fun of it. But I think there's a lot of utility. I mean, we both think there's a lot of utility mm -hmm. in going into how something could have been better. So we glad, uh, we're glad to see that you guys are also thinking about those things, uh, especially those of you who are creators. We're glad that these videos can help you guys when it comes to planning your own stories. So um, anything you want to say? Uh, no, just to echo everything that you said, um, a lot of these comments are really awesome. I love reading them, especially like the alternate retellings. Uh, and it's really cool to see that this is kind of sparking that discussion because it's, yeah, it is really easy to just hate on something. Um, but it's another thing entirely to recognize, you know, why something got popular in the first place and, and the merit that was inherent inherent to the premise and especially the art of the original Laurel Olympus and, you know, kind of look at what could have been. Um, you know, I don't consider myself a hater of Laurel Olympus. I consider myself a mega fan of what could have been. Yeah. What could have been, you know, the alternate universe retelling of Laurel Olympus somewhere in the other where we continue to get the good art. And, uh, you know, we got um, the payoff from a lot of these things that are being set up that do have a lot of promise, but are just never, never paid off in a satisfying way. Yeah, you know, uh, it's like I said in uh, episode six, if you had to put money on it and bet, like put some stakes on the line and make a bet for what happens 30 chapters down the line, uh, and you'd never read the series before, I, I think it's like an impossibility to actually be right on the money. You'd have the same <laughs> odds as like the Powerball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the Powerball. <laughs> so um, I guess without further ado, let's just get into episode 131, which is Interview with the Barley Mother. Yep, like Interview with the Vampire. Yes. Clearly. Yeah, so this picks up with Persephone telling her truth of what happened with the Act of Wrath to Hades. Yep. So we have a panel of Persephone saying, my truth. And he says, yes, and don't skimp on the details. As I forgot he... to color the, uh, the pen there, speaking of details. <laughs> what is he even clicking with the pen? It says click, but he's just holding it. It must be one of those pens with the clicker on the side. Okay. But I wouldn't know because it's the same color as his skin. Yeah, he's growing a pen from his uh, skin there. He also looks very different in this panel, too. Yeah. He looks much older. We get a nice uh, Spongebob-esque panel of her saying details, very similar to Patrick saying he can almost taste it. I can almost taste it. <sighs> Boy, crime fighting sure makes me hungry. No, but it's uh, it's really interesting how, like, as we go into this scene in this chapter, um, our feelings on this segment will become clear in terms of what it feels like is happening versus what's actually happening. But it's very interesting that when he says... I'll need the details. You don't see Persephone's eyes. You just see a very close, like a close up of her mouth when she's not making a real expression. So you don't need see what expression she's making when he says, I'm going to need all the details. And she goes, details? Right. <laughs> details, right. you say? <laughs> yeah. This is like something interesting and tangentially related. It's like, um, I, I like listening to true uh, crime. Yeah, true crime. And there's this one guy, Jim Can't Swim. I thought that I was going to say, it right. reminds me of a Jim Can't Swim like interrogation scene yeah. where the cop is asking the hard questions, and instead of answering right away with truth, uh, truthfulness and honesty, the suspect is going, details. Okay, and then like they're repeating the question so that they can stall for time and yeah. think of what to say. It's, it's pointed out by this guy, Jim Can't Swim, who's got like a very uh, a huge wealth of knowledge about the, trips, uh, the tips and tricks used in interrogations. And one thing that he always points out is that when a suspect who has like some sort of guilty conscience repeats it back a line or a question to the person asking it, it's to buy themselves time. Mm -hmm. So that's the first and you'll see where we're going with this. Yeah, we? it seems it might seem like a nitpick, but there's a very good reason why we're pulling this out. And yeah. the fact that you don't see her facial expression when she says that. Yeah. Details. 
Yes. The details you say. Exactly. So Hades continues and says, I don't want to force you to talk about something he'd rather keep secret, pouring her a glass of water, but the reality of the situation is this. My brother is volatile at the moment. Normally we could negotiate a minimal punishment for you. And you got This is a really bad panel. <laughs> <laughs> This is a terrible he's, panel. He's doing a Ross and Gone with Persephone. Right yeah, there. with Persephone in the middle. And neither of them are making, like, good poses. And then she just, like, whited out Zeus's eyes to make it look scary. He... I thought his eyes were closed and those were his eyelids. But... No, I think they're whited out. Yeah, now that you mention it, I guess, yeah. And so, Hades continues, however, I believe he feels that his standing will be affected if he is lenient with you. And so, I don't mean to scare you, but I would be doing you a disservice by concealing this information from you. We can do this later if you need more time. No, no, I can do it. And she grows a little flower in the cup, but her expression is very kind of like, uh... Her expression is very, um... Her, I, I guess the flower is supposed to be growing here because she's nervous, but her expression doesn't match that sentiment. Um, like, she's, she's not going like, no, no, I, I can do it. You know, like, looking earnestly at him, she's like, no, no, I can do it. Yeah, like, you know, no, no, like, very... I femme fatale almost like she's growing the flower out of boredom or nonchalance yeah that's rather than nervousness looks like out of context and so she says to be honest i'm relieved to tell someone about it finally and then she exhales and she says she's ready and she looks pretty miserable so he says let's proceed and he's got a tape recorder a big clunky tape recorder um but again notice how uh it's really interesting how the only time we get a view of her face is when she's re reacting to him saying Zeus wants to punish you. But then every time she's telling her story in these first couple panels, and she's like, no, 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 I can do it. To be honest, I'm relieved to finally tell this story to someone. It's all from the side, which is very impersonal. So you don't see a full-on reaction shot of her un 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 unless she's reacting to Zeus punishing her, which, again, might seem nitpicky, but it kind of ties into a little theory that you could craft with the way that this is framed, it, it almost seems intentional. Yeah, um, another thing I'll say just in film language, the proximity of the camera to the character also connotes the audience's distance to them. So you'll notice in those previous um, panels, Hades is never in the panels as he's explaining what's going on to her. It's, it's all, the focus is on her, but not only are you inside view, you're also quite far from her until she exhales. And so the audience doesn't really have a sense of closeness. Like, you don't really know what's going on in her head. I had no idea that her version of the truth for what happened to the act of wrath would actually be so different from what's in the official report. I for forgot instance. I forgot that it was because yeah. this scene obviously made no impression on me. Yeah. Because of the way it's told. It's right. told like the, the there's a reason why for a lot of people the original act of wrath, the way that it's told at the end of season 1 packs a lot more punch than the retelling. Yeah. And it's 100% the way it's framed. Yeah. Um the way that this is framed in this chapter it's very, um, it's very strange if you're trying to position this as the truth. Yeah. It's extremely strange. Right. And we'll just get into that as we go in. So he says, let's proceed. And he presses the red button on the, the asset tape recorder, but it doesn't compress because it's an asset. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he just taps it. But it's also interesting how they're supposed to have modern technology, but that's like an 80s tape recorder. Yeah. Why would he tape record it? Why wouldn't you just open his phone like the recording app on his phone it's probably again because uh she watched something where she probably watched a crime movie or she watched an interview with a vampire she yeah watched an interview with a vampire or like maybe mind hunter or something where they use that technology and she's like okay it's very like a child's idea of what an interrogation would be like they don't yeah. even use those types of t do they even use those types of tape i'm pretty sure they use digital tape recorders now there's no reason to use those types of tape recorders now and yeah, honestly it's purely because there's like a huge cr boom in crime movies in the 90s yeah the interrogation footage from official police departments and stuff it's always like they have a camera in the room yeah where they're recording and then you can see the suspect's body language and everything like yeah, that. yeah yeah because if they had the tape recorder in front of you it would be intimidating it would so be. it it's almost better to have the suspect not know that they're being recorded yeah yeah, because then the true body language comes out. Again, Jim Can't Swim has some great videos going into body language and what you can ascertain from that. Um, and so Persephone continues... I would just break to say that body language has been proven to be debunked and it's yeah. complete pseudoscience. It is. So it's... maybe edit that part out because Mooncat's latest video and then like just in general, I know that the police interrogation techniques that Jim Can't Swim covers are mostly based in pseudoscience. Yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, if you know that the person is guilty after the fact, you can look at their um, body language and then you can 
deduce all this stuff about their body language that says this, that, and the other. So it's interesting, but whether or not it actually, because that's why they have the visual camera there, right? Because you want to look at the person's body language, even if it is pseudoscience. Just like uh, giving somebody a polygraph, it's not necessarily the fact that the polygraph works, but... It's their reaction to it's it. It's the psychological stress of having to lie and yeah, having and to purposefully lie. Yeah, the, the best way to, to tell if someone's lying is not the body language, it's the way that they phrase their story yeah. and how many details they recall, and then specifically um, making them go through the same uh, boring or like in, in, insignificant part of their testimony over and over again to see if they still relay the same details, and then asking seemingly un you know, unnecessary questions yeah. or seemingly like nitpicky or unrelated questions yeah. that a normal person would remember. But if you're lying, it's like, I don't, I don't, I can't think of, I can't think of that. And then I can't keep it straight. Yeah. Not like only insignificant that, details. But other times um, when they provide too many details that w nobody would be paying attention to, or nobody would care about if they were telling the truth, that's when you also know it's a lie. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's too many details when they're lying. But then also if you ask them a bunch of irrelevant questions, and then seeing if they keep repeating the same story over and over and over again. Because yeah. somebody who's telling the truth, unless they just don't know the time that something happened, they should never be able to contradict themselves. If you were going through Persephone's timeline, for example, if she were lying about what she did when she was in that motel room, she might tell you, I checked into the motel, and then I was looking for apartments, I heated up some ramen noodles, and then I saw the arrest warrant on the TV, and then I freaked out and ran to the car and then like transformed. But if you were being perceptive, as to that story, you'd be like, wait a minute, that only covers you checking into the ho the motel and then like the hour preceding and, and following the arrest warrants announcement. But you went missing for like 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. So that doesn't account for all the time that you're missing. And then you start going freaking hour by hour. How many pawn shops did you visit? What did you sell at the pawn shops? What did the pawn shop lady t uh, say to you? What did she look like? What did yeah. you do after that? Exactly how long did you sleep? What TV shows did you watch? Do you remember the plot of the TV shows? Yeah. And it wouldn't be to like get, do like not only for the gotcha on like what TV shows did you watch and what was the plot of it and double check that against like broadcasting data, but also to see if she changes her story. The exactly. more detail you can get out of her, the more you can keep track of it and, yeah. and compare that against future statements. Exactly. Like, did you walk to the pawn shop on foot? How long did it take you to walk there? Yeah. How long did it take you to walk to the motel? What was the weather like? If, if you left Artemis's house in the afternoon then why was it nighttime when you arrived at the pawn shop? And I guess that's because it was the underworld. How did you get from Artemis's house to the pawn shop in the underworld? Did you fly? Did you take a taxi? You know, all of that stuff. Yeah. So anyway, he says, let's proceed, and then taps the 1980s, 1990s tape recorder. And then she says immediately, once you said that I was the reason mortals saw us as gods and not monsters, so leading directly into leading the story basically with manipulative information like remember when you said that i'm a great person yeah that's the first thing to be recorded yeah saying that what you do isn't important is like saying we shouldn't bother learning how to read or write because it doesn't keep us alive and this is a flashback and i think this is a flashback to the phone conversation after yeah. she was assaulted mm -hmm. i don't know if this is a repaste from that chapter it doesn't look like the old school art style yeah i i would have to go back and see um, but I, I don't really, I don't really care. I yeah, guess, yeah. I guess we could see it's like a G-Wiz, but, um, yeah. Because this is, this is directly from that chapter, but I don't think that was. Yeah. You're one of the reasons why the gods, why the mortals see us as gods and not completely, complete monsters. It's really interesting that you said that to her, like, the phone conversation, immediately after having met her for just that one night. Mm -hmm. Like, he doesn't know anything about her at that point. No. Um, and then she says, I liked that, and then we get a shot of his hand. And then she looks at him, like, almost expectantly. Well, she looks, you know, either expectantly or nervous to see him writing. And she's like, what are you writing kind of thing, right? It's like sometimes investigators will just start writing stuff down and that makes the suspect nervous again. Yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> so, like, she, like, it looks like she's halting for, for whatever reason. Like, did you get that? You know? Yeah. What is he writing down? Is he writing down that I'm a great person? Like, what's going on here? I mean, it looks like he's just writing gibberish. Yeah. So, um... Especially because she has a t he has a tape recorder, so why is he writing? Yeah, unless it's like a psychological thing. It's a psychological. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> alternate canon where Hades is a cop. Yeah, exactly. My name is Corey, and um, get this goofy panel, weird panel, this really weird panel where they forgot to do the line art on her other hand. Yeah, and she's just standing in the void. 
cross-eyed. Cross-eyed. And it's just really strange why you would have her standing. Not only is she standing in the void cross-eyed, but she's also staring right at the at the reader. Yeah, and why are her arms like like this, like a Barbie doll? It's you know? strange. She says, and I was born to be the goddess of spring. Aside from my natural powers, I was also born with a feeling. Again, this... I've never it's heard of this, either from Demeter or people who know her. Her internal monologue. Or her internal monologue. Right? Where was this feeling when Apollo attacked you? So Hades says a feeling. Can you elaborate? In here. She reaches across the table to, like, touch his chest. Why didn't she touch her chest? Again, I feel it in your heart. Again, it's like, it's like she frames everything in terms of other people, so we never get a feeling, or we never get insight into Persephone herself, and it seems like she's manipulating Hades by touching his chest instead of going, like, in here, in my chest. Yeah. It's like, in here, in your chest. Yeah, and that's one of the things that would have been so useful if this was, like, video recorded, because... If you're like an investigator and you're watching this and somebody's committed a horrible crime and then you see how they're interacting with the person who's interrogating them and they do something like this, that looks obviously manipulative yeah. <laughs> to anybody, right? And so she says, when I was young, it was barely a whisper. At first, it was easy to ignore while doing my duties. Another goofy panel. I know. Spongebob. She keeps drawing their eyes like Seuss characters where their eyes are like this all the time, but yeah. it just looks creepy. Yeah. When you have, like, eyes that just float in the middle of the whites, it's called, like, sanpaku eyes, you know? Yeah. It looks, it's it's known to look creepy. Yeah. It, it looks creepy. Masaaki Nakayama puts those eyes on, like, all of the creatures he draws, and it's bone-chilling. <laughs> it's creepy. You have, like, an, an uncontrollable biological fight-or-flight response when you see eyes that are staring at you like this. Yeah, show them the whites of your eyes. Yeah, because it's, like it's a, creepy. It's like it's a creepy. expression. Yeah. And so she says, in the beginning, I loved the work I did as the goddess of spring. More Sanpaku eyes. Yeah. I loved it so much that I never wanted the work to end. And we don't see her doing any work. We just see her with Demeter in these panels. And again, it's the thing where it's like, what you're saying is directly contrasting with what you're showing. Yeah. So she looks over her shoulder and she sees this feeling in, in the dark weeds. And she says, every day my powers grew and the climb was exhilarating. Um, I just want to point out that those eyes... In the bushes here look a lot like that dream that we got in early season one. Yeah, the stinky feet one. Yeah. Yeah. So if that was supposed to be Hades, it seems like if, like she said in a Patreon, allegedly, that that was supposed to be Hades shortly after that episode came out. Yeah. So this feels like a retcon. Yeah. Because when we saw that imagery before, I don't think it was the feeling. It was, she confirmed that it was supposed to be Hades. Yeah. And now she's saying like, it's a feeling. Well... I guess if you really wanted to go, like, five-dimensional chess, 300 IQ, you could say that because there is no such thing as free will in this universe, and there's physical determinism, and she has to be Hades' bride no matter what. Because of the fates. Because of the fates. The feeling is that sense of, you know, you have no free will, you're going on a collision course, there is only one outcome. And for a character who has been coddled and stifled and feels like she's being trapped in a cage her entire life, she could be dreading that on a subconscious level, but I don't think that's what it. <laughs> I know what it is. What it I know what it is, and I can't wait for you to get there because it's really dumb. But um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep my mouth shut. I think I have a piece of subconscious knowledge about this. Subconscious knowledge. Yeah, is this like buried knowledge? The goddess of chaos, Eris. Is that what this is supposed to be? Because it's like. Somebody was saying, I just got a glimpse of it, somebody was saying that she doesn't even have any agency because then, like, every single bad thing that she does, it turns out that it was somebody else pulling the strings. So she has, like, no operation or no no will of her own at all. That's a very convenient excuse for a psychopathic god. <laughs> yeah, that's very convenient. But, um, okay, so you don't have to answer that question, but I'm just, I'm wondering if that's what that is at that point because that is extremely lame. Um... So she says, but then one day I peaked, or at least I had mastered my mother's version of spring. And then we were talking about this when we were reading these chapters. If that's true, then how come she's got no control over her powers in the present? Yeah, this entire episode feels like it does, it directly contradicts all of the episodes where Persephone was losing her powers and calling herself a stupid village girl. And even prior to this, dude, the whole inciting incident to this happening was Persephone seeing the arrest warrant on TV and losing control of her powers. Yes. So which is it? Is she, does she have no control of her powers and can't control her powers in front of Hades and can't control her powers when she sees the arrest warrant? 
Or is she in complete control of her powers and like a master and even stronger than Demeter? Like, which is it? Because you can't have both at the same time. They directly contradict each other. And the other thing is, if she has no control over, their, over her powers and they're um, incited by extreme emotional uh, upheaval, then how come nothing happened when Apollo assaulted her? Like, those three things directly contradict each other. And this is a retcon. It doesn't gel with those ideas at all. I can explain all of that right now. Okay, explain it then. It's not being scripted or planned. <laughs> it's being made up as it goes along. That's the answer. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's all there that's is. That's the answer for all of these. Yeah, that's the answer for everything. I mean, because um, the assault was just put in there. because As a gee whiz. As, as a, you know, this is like something. Because in the original myth, it's about, it's, it's called like the rape of Persephone. But she didn't want Hades. Obviously, if Hades is supposed to be the love interest and you're subverting it, uh, you don't want Hades to do the uh, assault. And well, so... also in mythology, I was doing some Wikipediaing, um, and apparently Persephone also had a thing with Apollo in the myths. Like she fell in love with him or something because he was so beautiful. Or her and Aphrodite both did. So um, I guess that was her way of nodding, putting in a nod to that, but also character assassinating Apollo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, poor Apollo. Good Apollo, bad Apollo. Yeah, <laughs> that's just yeah. I don't understand. Um, Especially because, I mean, it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, and if the story had been planned out, you, you could have done something interesting there. But, I mean, obviously no power, uh, loss of control there with the strong emotional reaction. No, no loss of control with her powers, with her classmates bullying her. Or Apollo coming back for seconds, thirds, fourths, fifths. Yeah. And, like, just saying, go out with me. Why won't you go out with me? Go out with me. Why won't you go out with me? Yeah. All and... she did was, like... Twang is liar. Yeah. Um, you know, Aerie showing up when she goes to see Hades is is like, oh, she wasn't really angry. It was me using my powers on her. So she ne it seems like she's never given an opportunity to feel any genuine emotions. And then obviously, like we were saying, the thing about mastering spring, that's news to me. Because she's like, how come you can't get a handle on your powers? In many episodes, she turned into butterflies when she kissed Hades. And uh, she, she got all... All, all this hubbub when they were at the hospital. So that, no, that doesn't make any sense. And it's it's really just, this is just, like, this entire chapter just annoys me so much because, yeah. I just want to point out something about this panel here where she's looking at Demeter's version of Spring having mastered it. I think this panel would have been so much more effective if she was standing on the tallest hill and then you see the valley below her and yeah. all of the Spring is ordered like a checkerboard below her. Yeah. You could even throw in a clever chess uh call back to that one episode yeah that would have been more interesting compositionally and visually because right now she's like standing in the grass staring at a hill yeah. right in front of her <laughs> like hey he's staring at his triangle wall in one of the later episodes yeah like that hill is right in front of her face so why is she looking at it and if you're gonna talk about mastering your mother's version of spring i mean I'm no expert, but I mean that doesn't really. It doesn't just... look like the earlier version that we saw in the, in early season one, where Hades is saying I'm familiar with Demeter's version of Spring. Like the art in season one compared to this, like you can really see the downgrade. Yeah, like with Minthy on the horse. Yeah, exactly. That, that was a beautiful panel. This exactly. is just like somebody going, "Oh God, oh God, okay, mastered Spring. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, good enough brush strokes." Yeah, <laughs> right. like. And she continues, and then. Uh, from then on, every day felt the same. And the colors are totally different in this panel. Yeah. She said every day was the same. Um, so she's basically saying that after she mastered spring, everything got kind of boring. And she became dissatisfied. Yeah. She said suddenly the feeling was no longer quiet. Um, at this point in time, this was before the creation of Fallen Winter, because the whole point of the myth is that Fallen Winter comes because that's when Persephone is separated from her mother, yeah. Demeter. Um, so I'm guessing this is like an everyday thing where they just maintain the harvest and the growth cycle like day in, day out. I, again, I kind of know what she's shooting for here. If she's trying to get the idea across that like Persephone had mastered what Demeter had set before her and then she no longer fe felt challenged or personally, she never had any sort of goal setting process after that. She'd mastered everything before her. Then she got bored, you know? But here's my thing. My thing is, that's not really explored as to why everything got boring. Um, it's not like she says everything got boring because Demeter wouldn't let me go outside, color outside of her version of spring. 
Uh, it got boring because I wasn't allowed to challenge myself. It got boring because it was the same faces day in, day out. Nobody knew to talk to. My only friends were the ones that I had created. And I don't mean to be insulting, but flower nymphs live very short lives. So they're basically like kids to us, you know? Yeah. Um, that's just very, uh, it's, it's very vague once more. It's, it's not explained in depth as to the, the roots of her. Like, she's basically having an existential crisis. Yeah. And, and the reasoning for it and the roots of it are never really explored in a way that's satisfying to me. It's just like, I mastered Demner's version of spring and then suddenly every day was the same. Like, it's like, dude, you can pick up new hobbies, you know, yeah. you can read more books, you can cook new recipes. Unless Demeter was so controlling that she wasn't letting her do any of that, it's like, it's not like Rapunzel from Tangled, you know, mm -hmm. where she's literally trapped in a tower. It's like, I need more from the narrative for me to feel that she feels trapped by her circumstances. Yeah. Because right now, I don't know why she feels trapped by her circumstances, because it's not clearly stated. It's not stated that... Demeter wouldn't let me do my version of spring and because you know why if if you said if she said Demeter wouldn't let me do my version of spring the follow-up question would be why not yeah and there's no good reason for it a b it's implied that she was only allowed to do Demeter's version of spring because later on in this episode she says I got in a lot of trouble for the spring that you saw that one time but in the episode when that happened after when she was talking to Hades on the phone Hades made it sound like that version of spring was a common occurrence after Persephone was born. Yeah. So that directly contradicts the implication in this chapter that she was only allowed to perform to Demeter specifications. Yeah. In that chapter, it sounded like she was allowed to do spring however she wanted once she was born and Demeter gave her free reign. Yeah. Over spring. And she's only 19, too. So I just find it... I don't know, a little bit, um, if you want to have some character who feels like everything is getting... Oh, yeah, she is only 19, so, uh, what, like, it's not like this is her, like, you know, like, you would expect to see this in, like, some immortal creature right. who's reached year 300 and it's the same old spring over and over and over again. Yeah, because, I mean, there's no sort of concept of how long it takes to get good at mastering spring. It's like, learning to draw takes years. I'm still improving. I've been drawing <clears throat> since I was, like, five, so I've been drawing for over two decades, mm -hmm. and... I'm still learning things. I'm not bored of drawing. I don't say, oh man, like I've mastered drawing in a style that I like. You can try different styles, but like you said, unless you're explicitly forbidden from trying new styles and you can only master one, it's like a creative sort of thing, right? It's making spring. Spring is a creative endeavor. It's yeah. like it's like artistic. Yeah. So unless she's forced to do, again, it's like Demeter has like exact specifications, like you could have had a scene here where Demeter's like, no, no, Persephone, this grass is four inches when I specified three inches, like an HOA person. Unless you have that scene where her creativity is explicitly being constrained, I don't understand what the problem is here. And the fact that you that you brought up that she's only 19 makes it even more puzzling. Yeah. Where it's like in that panel where she says... Um, every day was a climb and I was learning the, the limits of my powers. She's an adult here. Yeah. She, she's not like 12. You know, it's not like some Naruto thing where she's like a master at age 8. Some kind of prodigy. You know, a yeah. prodigy at yeah. age 8. She's like close to her current age in this panel, I'm assuming. Yeah. Unless that's just how like Rachel draws 12 year olds. I hope not. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean in this panel where she says like, every day my powers grew and the climb was exhilarating when she's happy. She looks very similar, if not the exact same age that she is now. Yeah, so this is like, you know, actually since the Act of Wrath took place late last year, she must have been talking about how every day was the same. For like a span of a week, <laughs> because she's a dramatic teenager. <laughs> and it's like, oh man, I, I mastered my mother's version of Spring shortly before the Act of Wrath, which happened late last year, so you know. like uh, The angst was just uncontrollable. Yeah, for like a month, I was bored. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah. I also think that this might give context as to when she met Ares, because when she met Ares, she was already trying to get away from the nymphs, yeah. and she wanted quiet time reading by herself. So it seems like she was kind of already in, th in the thick of her ennui by the time she met Ares. Um, she was really interested in, in meeting a new person and seeing a new face. So it seems like at that point, she'd already grown tired of performing spring to her mother's specifications. But, I mean, how long ago was that? Because if, if it was a long time ago, then that would explicitly probably make her underage when she met Ares. So, like, it is, was it really, like, not that long ago, in which case she was only bored for, like, a month? Or was it a period of years, in which case when you showed her meeting Ares, she was, like, 15? I really hope not. Like, again, you wrote yourself into another corner here. The implications are just, like, 
you made your character 19, not 200, you know? Yeah. So it's like, how could you have this, like, traumatic backstory where she was bored for a long period of time and facing existential nihilism? Or existentialism, having an existential crisis. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, she says, suddenly the feeling was no longer quiet. Uh, my po- my power started to let me down, but I that's a very vague and nebulous... I, and I don't know what's going on in this panel, either. No. There's, like, some, like, very faint brush strokes here in the corners, and then she's just got long hair and she's standing on a cracked statue. But what does she mean, my power started to let exactly. me down? Exactly, there's nothing illustrated here that indicates what that means. That doesn't even mean anything following from suddenly the feeling was no longer quiet. My power started to let me down. That's, like, a completely unrelated thing. She could have said, like, something like, the feeling was no longer quiet, and my powers became unstable because of my, like, my powers suddenly became unstable because I no longer felt any joy in, yeah. in the creation that I once loved. And, and all I could hear was this, like, cacophony of, like, invasive thoughts. Self-doubt. Self-doubt. Yeah, and that yeah. would, if you wanted to retcon the fact that she at, at once both mastered Spring and has no control over her powers, you could just make it something like that. It stems from her existential crisis. Suddenly, where I was once a master, I could no longer even grow a basic daisy. You know, yeah. like, just say something like that. Because just to say my power started to let me down. Like, again, you're relying on your audience to plug the gaps. Because I have no idea what this means. And this no. panel doesn't show anything. Like, you, again, you could have had a panel with her struggling to grow a daisy. And she could have just said, like, for some reason, I don't know if it's connected to that feeling, but my power stopped working. I yeah. couldn't control them anymore. Yeah. Where I was once a master, I, like, struggled to do basic stuff that even the, the most, like, you know, small young, frail flower nymph could do, you know? Like Spider-Man 2. Yeah, Spider-Man 2, basically. And then she goes off on another tangent. It's like, my powers have nowhere to go. What does that mean? That's that's not related to not being able to control your powers around Hades, and also not related to this feeling. If she wanted to say, my, it's like my powers have nowhere to go, and connect that to a loss of control of her powers, then she should be walking on the street and flowers should be springing from her footsteps. It shouldn't be connected to strong emotional states. It should be constantly leaking out of her because she can't express herself. Yeah. It should be something that's a constant instead of like, oh, it only happens when I'm around Hades or it only happens when I'm upset. Yeah. You know? Um, I don't know why that's not like, and that would have been a really cool visual too if she walks on the street barefoot and like grass and flowers spring up under her feet. Like the, um... The god from Princess Mononoke. Yeah. That would have been really cool. Yeah. Uh, because when she's in Tartarus and the shades are there, she's going, come on, come on, trying to grow a flower out of the ground. But it's and a tiny little root. Yeah, and she's in peril in that situation. But she's supposed to be a master, with, and her powers are so strong they have nowhere to go. Yes, this is just a lie. It's just a total <laughs> lie. Persephone is lying, and that's when we start, me, me and Victoria start to notice that she's just lying. Yeah, there. she conveniently started growing a flower in in the water glass while she was telling this version of the story um to say that i'm a master and my powers have nowhere to go whereas in the original it was more like the original was more consistent with how we've seen her powers behave in the narrative so far yeah the original version of the act of wrath where she got so angry that she lost control yeah that's more consistent with her in, uh, loss of control being tied to severe emotional distress it still doesn't explain the apollo thing but it's more consistent than this, where, where she's a master, but her power started to fail her. Her powers have nowhere to go. That doesn't really... Which is Persephone, <laughs> tell me. Because if her powers have nowhere to go, how would that manifest in the act of wrath? If she has superb control, yeah. how would that manifest in the act of wrath? Like, either you intentionally did it or you didn't. Mm-hmm. If you're a master, then how do you not intend to do the act of wrath? Exactly. So... It just reads like a self-serving narrative. Yeah, it's very much like an unreliable narrator. A narcissist. A liar. (laughs) Right. Somebody who did something bad and is now trying to get away with it. So she continues, It seemed the older I grew, the more she didn't want others to see me. But that doesn't have anything to do with... Her powers. Her powers failing her. And she didn't even mention Demeter. She's talking to Hades. Hades can't see the visuals that we're being shown right now. So she doesn't say, like... While all this was going on, Demeter could tell that I was growing unstable, and she knew that I would be dangerous to others. So but I don't think that's the. I don't even think that's the motivation for this panel. I think she's trying to make Demeter a helicopter mom, and she doesn't want men to see her. That's what I think. But but what is she even doing in this panel? She's juggling smoke. It's like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. She's not using her powers. There's like really 
long blades of grass in the background. No, I think those are supposed to be trees, but the assistants ran out of time. So they just got the gouache brush and started doing this really hard on the canvas. It's just kelp. It's yeah, just kelp. It's seaweed. And so for reasons unknown, Demeter wants to cover her with a blanket. With a blanket. Play a game of hide and seek. And then she goes Persephone's running away. So Demeter's trying to cover her with a blanket, and Persephone's running away while juggling smoke. Yeah. That's what's going on in this panel. It's just odd. And then following, it seemed the older I grew, the more she didn't want others to see me. Or maybe see what I could do. What does that mean? She didn't want others to see what I could do, is basically what she's saying, right? But it's a confusing sentence to have after Or that. perhaps to let others see what I could do. Yeah. Or perhaps for others to see what I could do. Yeah, like a little bit of clarity, please. And so she's got this this flower nymph breathing down her neck. Yeah, but the flower nymph's staring into space. Yeah. It's as if she was afraid. I mean... It's as if she was afraid, question mark? No, it's so odd because earlier in the narrative, there is no implication whatsoever that Demeter is afraid of Persephone at all. Dude, Demeter has seen her act of wrath, and when Hera showed up to the restaurant disguised as Persephone, she acts like she just has migraines or something. Yeah. She's not afraid of her at all. She's not afraid of her when Artemis goes down and tries to get her to join the goddesses of eternal maidenhood. No, in the original act of wrath, it started with Persephone waking up and then trying to take a bath and then saying she gets the campus tour thing and says, no, mom, I don't want to commute. What's the point of all my studies? Everybody thinks I'm a joke. So did none of that even happen? Exactly. Who? She never she never brings that up in her side of the story completely. No. She never brings that up in her side of the story. So did she not even argue with Demeter about commuting to school? That in was Olympus? a lie. That was a lie. Who told that lie? Why was that in the report? Who wrote down the facts of the report? Did Helios see everything, including that argument? But here's the other thing. Why would Helios lie? Nobody ever follows back up with Helios who goes, Hey Helios, according to Persephone, blah blah blah, unless that comes out in the trial. Because what Persephone is saying right now directly contradicts what Helio said. She's yeah. not even covering the argument. No, because if Demeter was afraid of her, she never would have gotten in a shouting match with her. But that, we, I mean, was that not what happened with her and Persephone? Did that even, just like, not even happen, I guess, where she's arguing about the commuting? You know what, I think, I think this is like tinfoil hat time. I think Rachel wrote the end of season one to be the, fa the truth. Yeah. And there must have been, like, some comments or, like, some people speculating and, like, maybe pointing out that it makes Persephone look like a Mondo psycho to take out her mother issues on a bunch of mortals and commit genocide. So she had to rewrite and retcon the whole Act of Wrath to make her look way more sympathetic. But it doesn't match the original Act of Wrath at all, and it doesn't make sense for Helios to lie. There's no motive for him to lie. And it just makes, like, this retcon makes Persephone look like a serial liar. And um, it just, it doesn't make sense at all. And I, I don't even know if she went back and read the original Act of Wrath chapter or if she just started rewriting it. Yeah. Because if she read the original one, then why wouldn't you include the argument? No, because... Like, the original one, the through line is that Demeter's controlling, like a helicopter mom. In this one, Demeter's now afraid. And she didn't want her, to, she didn't want, she wanted her to commute because she wanted to hide her. If she wanted to hide her, why would she let her go to college at all? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know. She wouldn't even let her commute. She'd be like, no, I'm going to trap you here forever. Yeah. And I'm, I made the flower nymphs to look exactly like you because I want to hide you with the flower nymphs. Yeah. I don't want anyone to know that I have a little goddess here. That was, yeah, that was That doesn't make any sense. The original argument at all. If so. she was afraid of her and she was afraid of others seeing what she, what she could do, why would she let her go to college at all? Doesn't make any sense. And if the act of wrath happened then why would you let her go to college after that? If she was afraid, like, wouldn't that just <laughs> confirm your fears? Oh my god. Wouldn't that just confirm your fears? Yeah, my hat just jumped, it got spooked <laughs> by Persephone. So, yeah. in my, in, in, in like, my alternate retelling, the idea that I had was that the act of wrath happens, yes. and then Demeter hides Persephone, yeah. because she doesn't want her to get in trouble. So she hides her in the underworld so that Zeus can't see her because that's not Zeus's domain and Zeus is the one who punishes acts of wrath. Yeah. Why would she send her to an Olympus school right under Zeus's eye and, and potentially have her be introduced to Zeus and Hera and all of the gods of Olympus if she doesn't want anyone to know about her act of wrath? So the only, um, the only possible explanation is that Persephone's lying. 
That's the only possible explanation because what Demeter does after that makes no sense. No, and Demeter's not even here to defend herself. Well, actually, even even if she wasn't lying, what Demeter does after that makes no sense. No. Why would you hide a criminal right next to the freaking president of the United States? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Osama bin Laden was the mastermind behind 9-11, so let's keep him... Let's send him to Georgetown University. Yeah, let's keep... <laughs> All right, Osama, you're going that, to Georgetown And have him mix with the elite circles of Washington, D.C. It's not like they're going to be interested in his background and look into it. It doesn't make any sense. No, it makes... Demeter... Unless Demeter was trying to undermine Zeus, and she was... Like, the conspiracy was intentional, and she wanted to get rid of Zeus. It makes and her... she planted Persephone there to get rid of Zeus. The biggest dummy. It doesn't make any dummy. sense. No. Unless she's intentionally trying to undermine him. Yeah. So then she says it's as if she was afraid, which I, which we just called BS. And then crack. <laughs> Such a funny panel outside, out of context. I mean, her hand looks like a rubber glove. <laughs> and the plant isn't even, like, bursting out of no, the, the pl- it's not like the, like, if you had drawn the plant roots, like, all bunched up instead of these, like, pale things. I mean, have you ever seen a, a, a root balance? These roots don't even look... Like, they're, they're not even close to each other. No, like a root, a root-bound plant. Like, that's why you have to size up the container on a plant um, every so often. But the whole you, thing is a mass of roots. It, it, it's, it grows in a spiral, and you take it out, it's, like, shaped in the shape of the container. And they have actually... I've had cases where plants explode out of the terracotta planters because they're so root-bound, and they're, like, a gnarly tangle of roots. And this just looks like a piece of string. A spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um... And so she looks bored again in the next panel. Mm-hmm. Very telling, her facial expression. Yep. And then she says, I'm glad you got to see my version of spring. I'm kind of scared. I know, now. she looks like a creep. <laughs> she looks like a she looks like a mastermind, like, sociopath in that one panel right there. Yeah. Where she's staring directly at the, panel, at the, at the camera and yeah. the audience. Yeah. And, like, she looks very blasé and, like, smirking like she's getting away with it. Yeah, she reminds me of Alice from Luther. Yeah. And then we get that flashback panel reused. Yeah. I don't know why it had to be half black and white. It could have been all in color. That would have been so yeah, much better. Yeah, ruins the effect. And it so, does. Um, that's what you were referring to earlier when she says, that was a one-time event that I got into a lot of trouble for doing. Yeah. And Hades just happened to be there when that happened. Yeah, and she looks very, like, scheming in this panel. Yep. But why would she get in trouble? Exactly. She never made it clear why Demeter was, uh, like, upset. Like, again, you have to read between the lines. Is it because Demeter doesn't want anyone to know that Persephone exists? But if that's the case, then, like, why would she agree to let her commute to, to friggin' Olympus University? Yeah. And so then the through line here is after she um, made that version of spring, her punishment was the studies, hobbies, sports, and schedules. But we had... In the chapter where Hades looked into her background, we had images of her as a kid. Like, she was a child in some of those images, right? The spelling bee yeah. championship. Yeah. So here she's an adult? Yeah, it's, it's implied that her version of spring happened when she was an adult, and then the studies, hobbies, sports, and schedules. What is the timeline for this? Is this, like, a period of, like, a month? She's only 19. <laughs> You know, I mean, how many studies, hobbies, sports, and schedules could you cram into her life? Not only that, but when she was with Aries, apparently she had an hour every day to teach him alphabet. Yeah. The alphabet. Yeah. And read by herself. So she goes, I think maybe she thought they would cheer me up, keep me busy. Here she looks so much older than she did in early season one. Yeah. And for a time, they did. And then we get a super lazy... It's the same panel with her face blacked out. And then a bunch of eyes. Yeah, but it's not even, like, effective if no. it's supposed to be, like, a horror visual. No, especially because the background's so gray, and yeah. she's just smack dab in the center. Unfortunately, the feeling was too big. No amount of good grades or trophies could stop the feeling. But uh, it's confusing because she says that the good the, the hobbies and studies came after her version of spring. Is her version of spring because of the feeling? She said she got the feeling after she mastered Demeter's version of spring. Every day felt like the same. And then she said, uh, one day I did my version of spring, and then Demeter tried to keep me busy again with hobbies. But it's like, Persephone complained that the reason she got the feeling in the first place is because she was no longer improving her version of spring. So then she mastered Demeter's version of spring, and then the feeling came upon her. I guess restlessness, because she mastered everything she set, set out before her, and she was no longer challenged. But then Demeter gave her a bunch of hobbies and sports and all that stuff, and schedules. So it's like, wouldn't you find 
that interesting? No. It's like not like I I I'm I really like drawing and I really like writing, but I'm also interested in making music. If I couldn't draw and write anymore, I'd make music. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I'm also interested in fashion. I would like design fashion, like design clothes. They have multiple hobbies. It's not just one thing that I'm interested in. No, they don't even really go into detail with what the hobbies and studies are. Um, I like. I would like to learn another language and skateboard. I would like to learn another language too. <laughs> right. And, I mean, uh, okay, it'd be one thing if she said, "I lived and breathed spring. I loved it. It was my passion in life. It was the one thing that I lived for." Yeah. But we don't get that language. It's not like she's like you know friggin' prodigy, you know, like, sitting there when I wasn't doing spring. I was daydreaming about it. Yeah. I ate it. I lived it. I slept it. It's the one thing I love. Because even if that was the case, when she comes here, it's like it's a non-entity for her. She's not gardening. She's not going to parks. No, I mean, not She like has that. no interest in botany. It's it's very odd because spring, if, you, if we go with the through line that it's like a creative endeavor, mm -hmm. right? It's like art. And I'm sure a lot of people who are into art can relate to this. You like art, but in your art classes in school, you hate being told to draw the still life of the towel on the box, right? And for me personally, when I had to sit and draw that, it was never as good as the stuff that I love to draw myself. Mm -hmm. So you could have something similar where she tries to impress Demeter. Hey, mom, look what I made. And it's like an amazing, wow, this is spring. And Demeter's like, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to do it like that. Do it like the still life, right? Don't draw your uh, Sailor Moon OC, <laughs> right? Draw the still life. Uh, don't draw you know, original characters and come up with a story. Um, draw this basket of apples. Right. And if you're just drawing baskets of apples all day, it becomes very tedious, tedious and boring, and you're not really stretching your creative muscles there. Uh, so that would be the parallel that seems the most obvious to go to. But then after you, you come up with all that creative stuff, uh, eventually your art teacher is not going to force you to get into other hobbies and interests and things like that, right? And it's like... Again, if, if she loves spring so much, then how come she has no problem being in the underworld? Like, she exactly. should be miserable in the exactly. underworld, right? But the other thing is, why was Demeter afraid of her version of spring? It's not like she was jealous. She says she's afraid. Why is she afraid? Did anybody die from that version of spring? I don't know. Like, it's not like there's like, oh yeah, there was a prophecy. You know, there was a prophecy. Um, you know, she was like that as a kid and ended up committing genocide too, or killed somebody else. Or, you know, um, she thought of, I was too powerful and that I would attract too much attention. And then somebody, someday Zeus would swoop me, swoop me up and get me married off to another god. So she didn't want to attract attention and she didn't want anyone to know that she had a daughter. Like, there's no reason for it. There's no reason for her being afraid of Persephone's version of spring. If anything, I could understand jealousy. It would make me hate how she's writing Demeter to make the mother jealous of the daughter. But that is a more understandable motive than fear at this point. Why would she be afraid of Persephone's version of spring? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I could think of is if Persephone accidentally killed a bunch of plants and she made, like, a winter wonderland and she thought it was beautiful and Demeter's like, no. Because she eventually becomes, like, queen of the underworld or something. Or like her that, right? version of spring was so volatile that it, like, swallowed up an entire village overnight. Yeah. And a mortal village. A bunch of people got, like, speared by trees. Or they turned into trees. They turned into trees or something like that. But none of that actually happened. No, nothing was explained. So it just comes off like Persephone spinning her tale of woe to get Hades to feel bad for her. Yeah. So she keeps talking about this nebulous feeling, and then she says, I'm sorry, I sound ridiculous. You do sound ridiculous. And then he says, you don't sound ridiculous. Please continue. And she said, the cereal. Come again? The frustration. And now we're talking about something that hasn't been addressed in, like, 50 chapters. Not only that, but in the episode where it does come up and they show her doing photo shoots as the heir to the heiress to the Barley Mother Fortune, like, she doesn't think about the cereal at all. No. It's not like we had a scene where Artemis was eating the cereal, and then Persephone was like, can you please not eat that in front of me? Or Artemis was like, oh yeah, this is you, you look just like that. And then Persephone's like, yeah, very funny. Not you know, like I've heard that a thousand times before. We've yeah. never seen anything like that. We've never seen her react what to being been, a cereal mascot, ever. Yeah. What would have been better? She called herself stupid village girl. She never called herself, you're just a two-bit cereal mascot. No. It's... She, it, she, like, you didn't echo that at any other point in the, in the comic, ever. And in fact, her being the, the heir to the Barley Mother Fortune with a cereal mascot on it only came up, like, once. Yeah. And I think it was, like, Eros or somebody who, who mentioned it. Yeah, I mean, uh, what would have been better is that stupid Apollo scene with the crepes. If everybody at the table is eating the Barley Mother cereal and you have a scene where she's like in the background and then in the foreground somebody's got like the box of cereal and they're pouring, pouring the it. cereal she's down. Like, 
Yeah, and then they're like, oh yeah, so like, uh, Persephone, what did you want to talk about? Poor, 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 and she's like in the background making the space, and you see the cereal coming out, and she's trying to talk to them and zoom in on their mouth as they're going, hum, 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 yeah. with the cereal, and she's like, uh... I, Getting triggered, yeah. yeah. She, she's like, I said, do you guys think maybe I could go with you on, on your, like, excursion to the mortal realm today? And then they're like, what, Persephone? I can't hear you. Hum, yeah. hum, hum. And then she's like, did you please not talk with your mouth full? And then they pick up the box. Hey, look, it's you. <laughs> you know, why don't you have some Persephone? And then Apollo's like, oh, this is my favorite cereal. I love the way it tastes. And then she, hey, can I take a picture of you next to the box? And then he yeah. takes a picture of her next to the box. He's like, oh my god, it's like twins. Yeah, and then she just knocks the box out of his hand. And she's like, just shut up. You yeah. Know? And all the cereal spills on the ground. And Artemis is like, geez, Persephone, what's your problem? And she's like, you know what? Forget it. Just forget it. Instead of the crepes, because the crepes have nothing to do with anything. It was so Cereal random. would have been much better. And if Apollo brought it all over, yeah. guess what I brought? Yeah. Barley Mother Cereal. And then they start singing the jingle from the commercial. Yeah, that would have been so much better. But, I mean, no. And that's another thing that just makes it seem like she's just lying right now. Like, like clinging to any excuse. Like Ed Kemper talking about yeah, how his, his mom, mom abused him. <laughs> yeah, how his mom abused him. The only way I could have those girls was to kill them. And that's why he went on to do the horrible things he did. Um, when it's just like, no, that's not true, because that has never been a problem for you, like, ever. And she says, the frustration to be hidden in plain sight. What does that mean? I don't know. To be hidden in plain sight? I have no idea. Hidden from whom? I don't know. What does being hidden in plain sight have to do with a cereal box and being a cereal mascot? What are you talking about? I have no idea what she's talking about. You know what? It sounds like a narcissist is just complaining that she's not getting her due and that people aren't, like, worshipping. They don't know about me. Nobody knows about me. They're not worshipping in the streets, you know? Nobody knows my name. I'm a joke. But it's like, no normal person cares about, like, fame to this extent. Why does she want everyone to know who she is? This is, like, pure narcissist. Like, doesn't it come across as narcissistic? Yeah. How come nobody knows who I am? You know, I'm hidden in plain sight. <laughs> I, like, work a normal 9 to 5 job. You know, I want to be a comic artist, but I work a normal, boring 9-to-5 job. Nobody really knows that I, like, make these videos on YouTube. I don't- when I talk to people in real life, I'm, like, very blasé and boring, because, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not dialed in like this. I'm hidden in plain sight. Does that bother me? It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me- I mean, it kind of bothers me that I can't dress like this to work, but it doesn't bother me that, like, nobody knows who I am. Like, in fact, I would prefer- I prefer that. That's like- that's like Death Note Kira style. Yeah, like, everyone needs to know who I am. That I'm passing judgment on them. Do you <laughs> yeah. know who I am? You yeah. know, Persephone's like the type of person to be like, Do you know who I am? Yeah, like- the, It's so weird. There's like the type of person who donates anonymously, and then the type of person who's like- Who wants a wing in their name. Yeah, they're like, I want you to name- I'm only gonna donate to you if you name a wing of the hospital after me. Like, hey, Alex, buddy, I would've stuck around for your eyeball repair if you weren't so rude. Exactly. You know, and then I hear great things about the latest- one of the later episodes where she confronts Tori ten years later, and he's been living in her head rent-free. I know. <laughs> and she's like, do you know what you did to me 10 years ago over like a couple days that yeah. I enrolled in classes? And it's like, dude, who cares? Do you? Nobody knows who I am, mom. Everyone <laughs> thinks I'm a joke and I don't blame them. Yeah, but that didn't even really happen. So, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now she's just saying like to be hidden in plain sight. It's yeah. like really disturbing to her. The fear of only being known as a serial mascot has never ever come up before. Well, not only that, nobody, ever. nobody, apparently Demeter doesn't want anyone to know that she has a daughter, so nobody associates Persephone with the serial mascot. It would have been great if in that memory with Hades and at the party with Zeus, and basically every time we've seen it before, he goes, you know, you look kind of familiar. You look like the kid on the cereal box, right? Like if she, if when she sees Hades when he's drunk, the time they first met secretly, he goes, eh, I had a dream about the kid on the cereal box. And then now he's like, oh, that was her. And then Zeus at the party saying, like, if it was a costume party or something like that, like an elegant costume party, they'd be like, what's she supposed to be? The cereal mascot, mm -hmm. right? But no, it's coming out of nowhere. Like, I forgot. I forgot she was the cereal mascot until just now. And then to be, like, to, to be, like, a member of the audience and have this shoved in your face as if it was really important. It's very manipulative. Yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's like, this whole panel is tilted and it makes me really annoyed. Just turn on the grid, dude. 
Turn on the effing grid. Look at look at this. No, it's not centered at all. And then she goes, sorry, I'm getting off track. She is massively off track. She's mm. she's she's like a narcissist ranting that nobody knows her name at this point. Yeah. It's it's like um again, it's really like like a serial killer who taunts the police. Then in 74 he feels comfortable again because everybody's moved off Alan as a suspect. And what do we get? Three new letters from Zodiac in January, May, and July in 74. I'm, I'm the Zodiac killer. Don't you know who I am? Too. I'm so smart. Right. The, so. Pain of, the pain of knowing that I was the Zodiac killer. And I couldn't tell anyone how <laughs> smart I am. Yeah. Yeah. And so he says, would you like to take a break? And his head got dislocated from his neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, she says, no, I can keep going. No, no, I can talk about myself more. Don't worry. She's hey, like, I got plenty. I of can do this all day. Yeah. Then she says, this is the worst part. I, I think, think really quietly because she doesn't think. Um, she says, flower nymphs, you know them, right? And it's like, oh, Hades knows. Hades knows them all, right? Yeah. She says, I mean, I know of them. And he's thinking to himself, really good, to destroy my hard drive. When, <laughs> when this, this interview is over. <laughs> yeah. So she says, flower nymphs are rare. As you know, nymphs are tied to land, trees, rivers, etc. Rivers and trees are long lasting. Um, I guess that's a river nymph. Yeah, but N Minty's a river nymph, but she doesn't look like that. <laughs> okay. Minty's a river nymph, but she's bright red. So, yeah. And she says, flowers, eh, not so much. A very dismissive way of talking about... About the two people who murdered, who got murdered. Yeah, and she looks totally different in that panel. Yeah, her eyebrow is trying to leave her face. Well, her hairstyle is totally it's different. It's totally different. Yeah, she says, my mother made a special area dedicated to the restoration of flower nymphs. So I guess that part in the original telling was true. A safe place where we could grow the specific flowers required to create the nymphs. I created my first friends in that garden. I love them. And then we get some panels from previous chapters. Yeah, these are all repastes from says, the better art. Yeah, she says, we did everything together. Do you know what the last thing I said to them was? And I guess that part was true. So the whole part about the argument was true. Yeah, but she skipped over it because it didn't make her look good. It made her look like she committed, committed genocide because she got mad at her mom. Yeah, but I mean, she she went over stuff that hasn't happened, like happened out of context or like a setup, but there, there was no incident involving the Barley Mother cereal thing that morning, so nothing to tie that together. No. And there was nothing to tie her powers in either. Or the all, feeling. Yeah, it was all just about Demeter telling her that she had to, to commute instead of don't uh, live on campus. Yeah. It wasn't about, hey, you can't use your powers anymore, or hey, um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, hey, uh, let's take a, do a photo shoot for the Barley Mother fortune today. Yeah. Neither of those things came up, so they were really just brought in to make the manipula to make to manipulate the narrative to make her look as tortured and tormented as possible so you would understand why she committed genocide yeah so then we get a panel of her ear looking like a cheeto yeah hades looking off to the side as he continues to write nothing uh what i want is for you to leave me alone correct and i guess that's from the incident report she goes that part is correct yes this is a repaste of the previous panel um, I ran to the flower nymph's garden as fast as I could. We had a treaty with the mortals to not trespass. And yet, they disregarded it. And we get our boy pickaxe guy. Yep. And then she shows up with a scythe. Yeah. <laughs> and she's crying. No, that was really <laughs> funny because I mentioned this in the Discord. And they were like, first of all, um, how, can, how can Demeter have had an agreement with the mortals? That, so that they knew what they were doing was wrong, but then when she confronted the mortals, they didn't even know who she was. I mean, I, I mentioned that. But then the other thing that was mentioned was like, if she never meant to kill anyone, then why'd she show up on the side? <laughs> hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and she's crying. Yeah, yeah and so uh, she says, please stop. And then these guys just all give her... They look confused. They're like, what are you talking about, bro? We need to grow food because we're all starving because of the wars. Yeah, and she says, you're killing them. You're killing the nymphs. And he says, get off me, girl. And he shoves her. And then she stumbles. And he shoved her pretty hard because now she's all the way over there. And yeah. they all start laughing at her. And they say, who is she? Some goddess. Goddess? Should we be more careful? She's just a minor goddess. But again, if, if they have an agreement with Demeter that they know about, then how do they not know that she's Demeter's child? Like, they can't, again, you, this directly contradicts the idea that they knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. They should know who she is if they know that they're trespassing on Demeter's sacred land. Yeah. 
I, I don't I don't understand. And then the other thing is, if they know she's a goddess, then why aren't they terrified of her wrath? Like, this is a Greek god. No matter what kind of god it is, they've all done terrible crap to mortals. Mm -hmm. So, like, why didn't they just, like, if you wanted them to be ignorant, then they could have called her a nymph. And if you wanted them to be ignorant, then Persephone should have said something like, I thought that we had an agreement with the mortals, but these guys were trespassing and I got really angry and I killed them all, and then only later did I realize that none of them actually knew about the treaty. So I slaughtered a bunch of innocents, or something like that. Yeah. Because not only does she kill these guys, she kills the, like she burns the entire city. Yeah. How did that? The women happen? and the children. I killed them, and not just the men, but the women and the children too, and I slaughtered them like animals. <laughs> like, you didn't just go after Pickaxe guy, you went after, like, his freaking elderly grandma, yeah, too. Pickaxe son, Pickaxe pick grandma. Pickaxe son, Pickaxe grandma. Pickaxe daughter, they're all pick dead. Pickaxe dog. Yeah, Pickaxe dog is dead. <laughs> and so, he says, the goddess of spring, I think. And then, uh, don't worry about it. What's her face in that panel, though? It's, it's like a comical face. It's like face. a comical face. Yeah. And, and then, the, the nature looks totally different every single time. Yeah, and he says, um, the scythe has shrunk as well. Yeah. What's she going to do? Throw flowers at us? And she's got those red eyes. But then she kind of, she says it's the feeling that's doing it. The feeling could not be stopped. Yeah, so that's the end of chapter 131. I'm surprised there's only two art assistants, because it looks like there's like five people drawing this episode. Yeah. There's like at least three different colors in, in, the, in the nature. So now we're on episode 132, and for a brief moment, I got excited because I saw that this episode is titled Handkerchief, and I was like, oh, do we finally get a resolution on the handkerchief that she bought Hades? But no, um, I remember that we don't actually get a resolution to that, and then my hopes were dashed. But I didn't notice that this was called Handkerchief until I just pulled it out just now. Yeah, same. <clears throat> so she continues her narration. I don't really remember doing it. Um... And then we get this, like, shot of Persephone in the void uh, chopping off that guy's head. And I guess, you know, she can't really show that violence on webtoon or whatever, but it's kind of, like, really um, underwhelming composition-wise. There's no real... Like, it's really interesting how in her sanitized version of the Act of Wrath, the visuals are also similarly sanitized. Like, here, when she's coming forward with the scythe, this looks like a visual from, like, Sailor Moon or something. <laughs> You know, like Sailor Saturn, because Sailor Saturn's uh, wand is a big scythe. Yeah. It's very, like, sanitized. And then when she shows the guy with his head getting cut off, it's all white with very little blood. You know, it's not gory at all like it was the first time. Yeah, it kind of dehumanizes him a little bit. Exactly. he is a human, but it's being drawn like he's vanquishing a creature. Exactly. It looks like Magical Girl style. Yeah, and I will also say that the handle keeps disappearing and reappearing on the mm -hmm. scythe, and the length of it keeps changing yep. as well. But, you know, to be fair, Rachel has said herself that she's not very good at action, mm -hmm. and it's not really something that she likes or spends a lot of time thinking about because it's just not... She could have found a reference for her body here. I mean, look yeah. at her arm. <laughs> I mean, her between, arm. Her arms and the fact that her feet just melded into a point. Oh, at the yeah. Bottom. What the heck? It she looks like, like a bagworm here. Yeah, the more you look at it, the more you're like, what? What's happening? And it would have been way more dynamic if her hair followed the path of the scythe, too. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a couple things you can do that really apply motion. I personally like using motion lines. I did a lot of motion lines yeah. in Rage. Uh, to show the direction of things, but in color, motion lines don't look as good as they do in black and white. I think a really good example of motion and fight scenes is One Punch Man, the manga. Yes. It has terrific fight scenes. I would recommend anybody who wants to do fight scenes to look at that and to see the motion between the panels and, like, ideas for composition and dynamicism. I think um, the one scene in DCG that looked really good was when uh, they were, Oledo got sucked off the ship. Yeah. That was a really well done scene and you thumbnailed it. Yeah. So you came up with the composition for those uh for those shots. Yeah. I thought that was a really good job of implying motion when you had limited ability to use like motion lines and stuff like that. Yeah, um and I think uh this is like one of the, the issues I have with webtoons overall. Uh I've read a lot of webtoons, not from start to finish, but mm -hmm. just like a couple chapters, handfuls of chapters. And a lot of the Korean webtoons are action webtoons mm -hmm. and so um I would say the Korean <clears throat> ones have like, sort of better ideas for how to do composition right. when it comes to action. But even then, the vertical scroll format is really hard to do. 
good action in in mm -hmm. general and i think that's part of the reason why there's less action webtoons and also part of the reason why action is a less popular genre which is probably why they had the action contest um one of the better action comics that i've read is ghost king yeah that has really good action yeah so if you're trying to do an action web comic and you want to see how to do it in a vertical format that's a good one to look mm -hmm. at um but, but it's really difficult like you said you can't get the feeling of quick cuts and there's no, like, the thing that really makes it look su super epic and like, uh, manga is when they have, like, the full page spread. Yeah. And you can't alternate, like, action is very dependent on creating a sense of motion through, like, small panels intercut with big dynamic panels for, like, a sense of scope and scale. And you can't really vary panel size as much when you're doing a vertical scroll. Yeah. And then you can't do, like, the chips and slices, like, shattered glass like you could do with manga either. No, I think Berserk and One Punch Man are, like, some of the best action manga out there, Ice Shield 21 as well, mm -hmm. for like in terms of getting across motion uh, on like a two-dimensional still image, but yep. suffice to say, she admits that she doesn't like doing action, so yeah, I mean, no real surprise here that the composition and everything is just a little awkward. So um, then we get this masterpiece of a panel where it's clear that I think the background was duplicated and flipped at least like, I want to say one, two three, four times? Five times? I don't know. It's really weird and strange. Yeah, it's a Rorschach test. But you can tell that it's been duplicated and flipped multiple times, just like in the previous panel that we covered in the previous, I think, 115? Yeah. No, no, no. It was the video videotape. Yeah. The videotape was, revealed. Yeah, when she's running. Which is like 114 or 113. See Hades, yeah. So then she says, uh, yeah, when I came through, the damage is done, the feeling is gone. And then we get a panel of Persephone looking like a total goof and she drops the scythe or I guess I don't know if she's dropping the scythe if there's no motion lines or anything the scythe is just barely touching her fingertips yeah I think this panel would be more effective again if the scythe like was clearly falling to the ground and there was motion lines or something like that and I really hate that she now has like as a regular thing for the cameras to be staring or the the characters to be staring into the camera yeah I hate that and for it to be such a large panel but you don't have her feet at the bottom, and it's kind of like just an awkward composition. It's I just... think a I think a wider shot would have been better. Yeah, if it was like a smaller panel, but she was farther away, and the body was in the foreground, blurred out, and her hor like her horrified face was like a little bit further away, and the scythe had, was dropping from her hand, or the scythe hit the ground with a thunk. Yeah, at, at her feet, and she was going like this or something. And again, if you have the body in the foreground, that would have made it way more effective. Yeah, you could have had her looking like uh, Sissy Spacek in Carrie. Yeah. The Carrie movie from the 1970s, where she's covered in blood. Mm -hmm. And the whites of her eyes, because, I mean, clearly, she likes drawing the whites of the eyes. You could have made it a very intentional horror visual instead of this... Um, I nothing think burger. Yeah, a little slapdash. But, uh, so she continues to say, leaving me with nothing but my own horror and panic at what I had done. And so... I like I like this panel where she has Yeah, the that's blood. like the more effective panel. Uh but you could have replaced the other panel with this panel. The yeah. other panel is kind of redundant. Yeah, this reminds me of Suspira. Yeah. Um again, it's it's nice. I like her expression. This in this panel the artwork looks grotesque and it fits the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So I like this panel. Um and I like the blood. And so <coughs> she says I was the goddess of spring. You see her hand with the blood on it, and I committed an act of wrath. But blood's gone. <laughs> I I don't see what being the god of spring, the goddess of spring, has to do with. That doesn't inherently make her a moral person. No. Uh, so. Blood's gone. Yeah. So the blood is gone in this next panel, and we're back to these visuals that are just kind of odd. I mean, the hair. It's really funny how the 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 smack dab center of this panel are boobs. <laughs> yeah. If you did this grid. horrific, this horrific incident, and then this panel, like this, the the number one focus in this panel is her boobs. Yeah, um, and it's just strange, like wisdom tooth shape. Yeah, waist. It's Kim Kardashian. Yeah. yeah, that's not like accurate anatomically. Um, so she says, "My panic spiraled in a way I'd never experienced, and my powers acted on their own." It's really not a good look to keep saying like oh no it wasn't me it was the powers it well first powers. she says i was the goddess of spring and i'd committed an act of wrath and then she says um leaving me with nothing but the horror of what i had done she emphasizes the eye and then she says uh you know my pat my panic spiraled in a way i never experienced and my powers acted on their own so first she takes ownership 
But then she immediately undercuts that with my powers acted on their own. Yeah. My panic spiraled in a way I never experienced and my powers acted on their own. So yeah. now you have, like, you have the admission of guilt, but then the quickly, like, oh, but it wasn't my fault. It was my powers. Yeah, but I, then also it's like, what happened to the feeling? You know? Yeah. Where does the, the feeling fit into the it? The feeling doesn't fit into this at all. Yeah, so then we get an Animorphs transformation sequence. <laughs> as vines begin to shoot out of her back. And she says, and just like that, I was big. That's, like dissatisfying i know <laughs> she's hunched on the ground like a beast crying like it's so lame yeah she's yeah it's very dissatisfying she says i had never grown large like that before well i mean what's the relevance like the thematic relevance of growing so large well the other thing is um she accidentally stepped on a guy and she goes oh! and like again this looks like comedy like this looks like like, she's having the reactions of, like, killing a bunch of people as, like, Giselle from Enchanted again. Yeah. And so it's almost, like, comedic, you know? Like, it's 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 not scary or dramatic. That scary, dramatic tone is just completely lost, and we just <laughs> dive right back into comedy, like, in the original Act of Wrath chapter. No, but, I mean, these two panels are drawn by two completely I know, the colors people. are totally different. The background, the, the sky. The background is totally different. The, the sky trees. is totally different. The tree is totally different. The colors are totally different. I don't understand. The way the feet are drawn. I don't understand why they don't just have one background artist. Oh. That's what I don't understand. Why are you getting two different people to draw the same background? I don't know. It's like, why? <laughs> just use the same background. Please. I don't get it. Yeah, so um, to say I was out of my element was an understatement. And we have all these running civilians. The more I attempted to reverse what I had done. And it's like, you can't reverse. You can't reverse killing someone, dude. Yeah. How, does, how do you... Like, again, this just sounds like a serial killer's, like, narration of the events. I tried to reverse it. How, like, oh, let me, let me stop you right there. How are you going to reverse killing somebody? How does that happen? No. How would you possibly reverse it? The more I tried to stop, like, the more I tried to bring that guy back to life, the more people I killed. Like, that's what she's basically saying yeah, here. Yeah, there's a movie, or there's, like, a joke or something. I think it might have been, it could have been, like, a Tumblr joke or something in the Hannibal fandom or something. I don't know. But it's like, um, oh, I didn't stab him. He ran into my knife. And it's like, he ran into your knife 47 times? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't collateral. You killed him? No, I shot him. Bullets in the fall killed him. It's very silly. And it's like, we were also talking about this when we first read it. But the faces and the speech bubbles uh, is like comedic. And it's just a tonal whiplash. The other thing is, I think this is a redraw of that other panel where she had the goofy face and they yeah. just changed the face. They did. They did. Because it it's the same dumb angle. It's the same angle, the same panel, and... Um, Instead of her other arm being, like, down at her side like it was in the beginning, they yeah. just changed her, like, her body language with her arms and they changed her facial expression. Yeah. But it looks like the exact same panel. It is. It is. Because the civilians are the same. But this kind of tonal whiplash, I was having a conversation with somebody about this. The latest Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man No Way Home has a scene, this is a spoiler, if you haven't seen the movie, you want to see it, you don't want it to be spoiled, just take this point that this is a spoiler. <laughs> okay, so the spoiler- We'll give you five seconds. Yeah, five seconds to get out of here. <laughs> so the spoiler warning is over now, but uh, Marissa Tomei's Aunt May gets killed by Willem Dafoe, mm -hmm. the Green Goblin, of course. And shortly after that, you have uh, the three Peters, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland, in a high school chemistry lab, yep. making jokes with each other and making potions to cure the bad guys by turning them good. And they're all cracking jokes and everything, and it's like Marissa Tomei just died in a brutal, gut-wrenching scene that will spell, like, depression, long, like, lifelong depression and sadness for Tom Holland's Spider-Man. And they're, like, cracking jokes. And it's it, before that, even, you have Zendaya making bread jokes with Andrew Garfield. I was about to say, isn't, isn't the, the thing about the bread... Yeah. After, immediately it's after immediately after immediately after Ame dies so the, they're I, throwing bread on the ceiling I don't carry an ID with me you know it kind of defeats the whole anonymous superhero thing why'd you do that Will you look at me me please yeah that kind of tonal whiplash when you have people dying and like serious stuff happening it it undercuts any seriousness you have in a story With tension yeah, in tension and it, it almost it's like it's i don't feel bad for persephone in the scene even if she like she can be crying in this but the fact that you have these people saying ah the giant woman will kill us all ah run for your lives 
uh, and she's like talking about something that happened to her that was traumatic it undercuts any sort of sadness well the other thing is i think this was intentional because it makes her killing people look more sympathetic and it doesn't make you realize that she basically committed genocide yeah like if it wasn't funny then you'd be seeing like squished bodies and people fleeing in terror but they had to make it funny because otherwise you'd be like wow the main character of this comic killed like however many thousand people yeah like because if you don't make it funny then it's just horrific you know so she had to make it funny is the thing is what i got out of this and it's just another way to manipulate the narrative just like with kid hades yeah i mean that's that's another thing is like there's a lot of stuff in the comic that is taken seriously by honest fans we're fans of the comic but people who are like the real part the people fans. the people who will swallow the narrative that rachel is trying to sell yeah um because rachel wants you to take some things seriously as moral transgressions but not others yeah like she wants you to take minthy slapping Hades seriously she wants you to take uh persephone's assault by apollo seriously but she doesn't want you to take persephone committing genocide seriously and she doesn't want you to take hades almost killing that paparazzi guy seriously so you have the latter two events which are extremely violent and like horrific acts of the main characters she takes those two acts and like makes them funny because if it's if it's not funny then you have the main character almost killing a dude and laughing about it and then and acting like you know cha-cha and hazel from freaking umbrella academy yeah and then you have the main female character freaking committing genocide right and it's like what kind of comic is this <laughs> is this a serious comic or is it like a jokey comic where the greek acts of wrath are just like oh you know just greek god things you know yeah. like you can't have both at one time it's the same thing where it's like you have to choose yeah do you want this to be a serious comic talking about serious emotional issues and trauma and like things that act people actually go through or do you want to have a comic where like oops persephone accidentally killed an entire town of mortals that um, darn persephone yeah. it's like it's like the same thing with the simpsons like homer beats bart up all the time and in real life that's not funny but you don't take it seriously in the simpsons because nothing is taken seriously in the simpsons Oh! 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 What the hell is wrong with you? But you can't have a freaking episode where, I don't know, Bart gets bullied and have it being taken seriously yeah. by the audience. Because that's just not what The Simpsons is about. You can't have your cake and eat it too. No. Either violence is funny. Or it's traumatic. You can't, you can't, you have to pick one, you know? Yeah, because otherwise, especially when you involve the same characters over and over again, it becomes like... It just becomes like the author is showing blatant favoritism. Yeah, favoritism, but also there's no coherent theme. And it's like, well, now I can't take anything seriously. Like, like again, in a Marvel movie, you have Thor, Love, and Thunder, where a lot of people were very upset. Again, spoilers. For Thor, Love, and Thunder. Yeah, Thor, Love, and Thunder. A lot of people were very upset with the breast cancer of Jane Foster, mm -hmm. the way that was covered, Natalie Portman's character gets breast cancer and they show her in pain and suffering. Going and she, through chemotherapy and Yeah, stuff. chemotherapy. And then you have Christian Bale's character, who's the God Slayer, whose daughter gets killed, I believe. I haven't seen the movie, but I, I saw a review about it. So the daughter gets killed and he's very emotionally devastated by that. But then in the same movie, you have like screaming goats as a joke. <laughs> And then you have Thor, uh, you know, Chris Hemsworth acting goofy with uh, Russell Crowe's Zeus mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And in a movie with a very short kind of time window where all this stuff is happening, it's very disingenuous to tell people to take Jane Foster's cancer super seriously. But then you have screaming goats like 10 minutes later and it's the tonal whiplash is a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot and it's disjointing and very jarring. It's almost impossible to pull off. Yeah. So I would say most people should not try to pull it off. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing I, I would, I can't even say that Supernatural did it well because I haven't no. seen Supernatural in so long. The last time I watched it when it was, it was when I was like 13 or something like that. And you probably have the worst taste in movies. <laughs> yeah. And at the time I was like, oh man, Sam and Dean's brotherly bond. So tragic. <laughs> and then you have like Dean making jokes at people or whatever he yeah, does. And yeah. then you have the episodes with that, that guy who was the, the troublemaking shapeshifter who ended up being an angel or Loki. something like that. No, no, no. Not like this. Dean, no, no, no. Don't 
Come on, David. All right, good. Who wants Chinese? Dean. <coughs> Dean. Whatever that means. <laughs> You remember they called him like the trickster or something like that? Yeah, he called himself Loki. But then yeah. it ended up being Gabriel. Yeah, some, something, something like, like, that. like that. So at the time I thought it was good, but if I watched it, I tried to watch Supernatural again a couple of years ago and I was just like, no. Couldn't get past Dean's jokes. Yeah, Dean aged so poorly. <laughs> he aged like milk. So I was like, I can't watch this. <laughs> <laughs> you mean Carly's MySpace address? Yeah, MySpace, what the hell is that? <laughs> Seriously, is that like some sort of porn site? So, yeah, I, I can't really think of anything that strikes the balance really, really well, but, um, yeah. I'm trying to, and I, I'm drawing a blank. Unless the whole thing has, like, a really glib tone. But even then, like, you don't feel bad for the characters, because it's impossible to take seriously. Yeah, even Always Sunny in Philadelphia has an episode about D and D Caitlin Olsen's character is constantly being, like, bullied and put down by the other characters. Mm -hmm. And there's an episode about her wanting to become a famous actress in Hollywood, and um, she like sleeps with a sleazy producer, mm -hmm. and she thinks she's gonna be super famous. And then she thinks she's going to like a really famous movie premiere or something like that. And then it's revealed that it was just a joke. Played oh on her. my god! <laughs> okay, calm down. You can do this. You did this all by yourself. You can do this. Ladies and gentlemen, a very funny woman, Miss Sweet D Reynolds. D Reynolds is a star. The joke's on you. We checked you! We set the whole thing up! Yeah! Yep. I chartered a jet! We flew all over Philadelphia for six hours! I, and I'm a garbage man! None of this is real, Dean! None of it! <laughs> hey, hey! Some of it was real! Yeah! You banged that guy! <laughs> Why would you do this? We wanted to show you that you could sink lower. You're talking about killing yourself? Some <laughs> things you just don't joke about, okay? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, took yeah. it hey. too far. Too far! Right. Yeah. <laughs> bad for her because these guys are all terrible right what they did was horrible right but it's also funny right right and so people who because the episode starts with her eating a, a cake that she found in the dumpster and drinking and they're like hey man Dee's really depressed because we're always harassing her let's cheer her up oh my so god they cheer her up by doing that to her and it's like you would never see that in a modern day always sunny in philadelphia because i think glenn howerton and rob McElhenney, the two creators they kind of realized that some of the jokes that they did in previous seasons kind of pushed the envelope and didn't age very well. So the humor but has changed. I think a lot. comedy is inherently like if it's funny, it's inherently like bordering on offensive. Yeah, well, I don't think I don't think all comedy has to be edgy comedy to be good. But I think unless you're making a very incisive observation or pushing the envelope, um, it's really not going to be funny. You know, like comedy is not nice. Yeah, you know? yeah. Somebody's feelings are inevitably gonna be hurt, probably. But um, it's because a lot of it has to do with like expectations, right? And and, and social situations. setup versus payoff. Yeah, setup versus payoff and observational humor. Yeah, like physical comedy isn't funny. Obviously, like if you just take the contents of of a scene that's physical comedy, like again, what you were saying about Homer strangling Bart, or. I don't know, like, if you have a gag about a guy being electrocuted or something like that, like, it's, it's, if it happened to you in real life, it'd be very painful, but people laugh at physical comedy all the time because of the situation, because of the context in which it's presented, right? So, I mean, if people were always up in arms about, well, like, that's not funny, like, you shouldn't joke about that sort of stuff, that's one thing, but, I mean, what we're saying here right now is that you're taking something that is, uh, the, the narrative itself presents as being serious in one context, but then it, it does a complete 180 and presents it as comedic in another context, depending on who's telling it. Right? I think there's a difference between comedy that's, like, self-aware, and then there's comedy that's, like, you know, zany, silly, oh my god, raffle random comedy, which is the type of comedy that Rachel tends to, and that's why I don't think it's funny. Or people who joke about racism. Like, I joke about racism all the time. And it's like, I'm not allowed to talk about that as a non-white person because it offends white people. Like, what kind of logic is that? If it's funny. I think it's funny, you know? Yeah. Um, if I were to just completely limit my humor to, like, socially acceptable humor, then it's like, you know, it's, first of all, humor 
thrives from um, setup and payoff. Yeah. But it also thrives from observing social norms and then almost breaking them. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, we all know blah, blah, blah. And then, like, you say something that is an uncomfortable truth that you wouldn't be able to say if it wasn't funny. Exactly. You know, that's how comedy works. Yeah. It doesn't work like this. Like, it'd be one thing, like, what we were saying when um, Artemis comes over to Hades' house. The reason that's funny, if she showed up and saw the TV with the boobs on it, is because Hades is kind of acting like a creep in this scenario, and it would be funny to acknowledge it. Yeah. You know, instead of the comic, like, what the comic does, on the other hand, is it uses comedy to sweep the flaws under the rug instead of using comedy to put a lampshade on itself yeah. and turn a scenario that could be interpreted in one way in a comedic way. Like, it would actually be funnier if Hades kept interrupting her and going like, wait, 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 you're telling me, you know, and like trying to, you know, put the interrogation light on her face. Because what yeah. she's saying sounds so suspicious. Right. You know, right. that would be funnier because it's like you're playing with the expectations and being self-aware. And I think... The problem with Laura Olympus's humor is that it has the self-awareness of, like, a walnut. You know, there's, like, zero self-awareness. There's no sentience when it comes to the humor. No. The humor has, like, the sentience of, like, a dead fish. Like, yeah. it's not it's not self-aware. It's not self-referential. It's not calling itself out. It's not lampshading itself. It's just, like, zomic, ruffle, ra lol, random, roar, you know? Yeah. And it's also really dated, and it kind of ages Rachel, because she yeah. was, like, younger when that type of humor was popular. Yeah, I mean, because if you, like, probe further about this scene where she's saying, sniff, wait, and then you have these these people running away with their comedic sort of um, exclamations, it's like, what are you exactly trying to make light of in this situation? Like, um, again, if, if you wanted to take this specific scene and make the interaction funny, what would be funnier is if you did show her step on one guy and kill him, and then she's like, oh my god, no, 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 I didn't mean to do that. And then she grabbed another guy and crushed him, and then she's like, oh my god. And then she just goes on, and she's, like, really serious and dramatic, and then Hades is like, a, yeah, you know, and she's like, is this funny to you? And he's yeah. like, so <laughs> let me get this straight. You tried to help these people, and you just kept, like, crushing them yeah. and, like, stepping on them, and, and you're claiming it was an accident, like you said, right? And it's like, it gets to the point of self-parody, right? Where she's like, and then I tried to help a guy by picking him up, but unfortunately his scarf unraveled and I hanged him. Yeah, exactly. With his scarf like and it then, was a and, and then I tripped and I crushed the entire village. Yeah, you know? and then I, I tried to help this, this guy with his cart, but when I picked him up, I didn't know my own strength and I ended up flinging him into a tree and he got impaled, you know? And she's like trying to talk, and it's so unbelievable the way she's talking about it, that it's like, okay... Yeah, it's, again, like, this guy ran into your knife, like, 47 times. But it would still and... undercut the scene. Yeah. Like, no matter what, if you wanted the scene to be, like, dramatic and sympathetic for Persephone, you would not put comedy here. No. So it, it really depends on what the actual intention... And and the other thing so... that we were saying yesterday off-camera is that the comedy doesn't do anything. Like, like we were saying, the difference between Persephone's POV and the, the truth, like, Helios's POV... <laughs> There is not much of a factual difference at all. The biggest difference that she mentioned is she introduced a ton of backstory into her, like, conception of events that coincidentally just happens to make her look much more sympathetic as a person and also has nothing to do with the day in question. Like, her being afraid of being a barley, the barley mother mascot has nothing to do with the day in question. And then her, uh, you know, having the ennui around her powers has nothing to do with the day in question. Yeah. Neither of those things. Like, Hades, if he had any sense he'd be like this is irrelevant irrelevant your honor you know yeah. like this is like this is like the stuff in a defense trial where it's like yeah ted bundy murdered a bunch of women but you know he was abused by his mom as a kid you know yeah. it's like it doesn't change the fact persephone's not disputing any of the facts of what helio said no she basically admits to the argument with demeter because she says that the words that she said to the nymphs were true but she says, like, that was one of the few things that was true. But it's like, why else would you be mad at the nymphs? Yeah. Are you telling me that the argument with Demeter didn't happen? She's very wishy-washy with the facts. And then, uh, since this is just a redraw of the actual panel from the Helios narrative, I'm assuming that everything that went down in the Helios narrative after the Act of Wrath started was true. And the only difference is that Persephone's like, wait, wait, wait. But I was crying when it happened. Yeah, because why Why would she chase after the mortals to say, wait? They're running away. She should exactly. the opposite Exactly. Way, her narrative... Her. Her narrative makes no sense. Yeah. Crucially, she's not dis that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. She's not disputing any of the facts. If you had a real defense, if Ted Bundy didn't kill those women, he would say, I didn't kill those women. But instead, he's trying to bring in the abuse from his mom or his parents as if that justifies it. Yeah. It's like, dude, you're not disputing the fact that you killed those women. Yeah. You still did it. 
Who cares what your traumatic backstory is? Right. Same thing with Persephone. She still did it. Who cares yeah. what her traumatic backstory is? Yeah. She's narrating this whole thing like a guilty person. She's not disputing the facts. She's just trying to insert a lot of, uh, you know, pro-defendant uh, uh, backstory. So in our discussion about how we were interpreting Persephone's side of the truth, I actually thought it was very uh, interesting because there is another YouTube channel that we both watch that is a true crime YouTube channel called Crime Weekly, wherein one of the two people who host the discussion is a former police detective, right? And um, right now, at the time of this filming, they're talking about the Adnan Syed case, mm -hmm. and it's very insightful stuff, but um, that that person, Derek Lavasser, actually said something that I thought was really um, well articulated, and it perfectly captured the sense that we're getting from Persephone's narration here, yep. in that it's providing context to make the defendant um, look more empathetic or more understandable to the jury or whoever's judging them. In this case, it's Hades, mm -hmm. right? So she's she's basically trying to justify her mindset as to why she did it instead of providing any sort of, uh, like, alibi, alibi for how it wasn't her, right? Happens every day in court. I can't tell you how many cases that I've been on where we have someone who's murdered someone or was selling, you know, kilos of cocaine right in front of a school and the lawyer will spend 20 minutes explaining how the reason they were doing this was to feed their family, whatever it might be, just to try to soften their their reasoning behind doing it. When when the, the facts are indisputable, they'll focus on character, you know, trying to soften up the jury to give them a lighter sentence. Yeah, so then she's crying. But it's like you said, why is she even chasing after them in the first place? Why didn't she just, why is she saying wait? Why is she, like, why did she walk the mile or whatever to the village to say, wait, and then yeah. coincidentally destroy the whole thing? If she just turned around and gone home, no more people would have died. It's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. At this point, it looks intentional, and she's just trying to say, like, oh, but I was crying when I did it, so that makes it okay. Yeah. The more damage I caused, the more upset I became. And this, again, looks like, this looks comedic again. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, tiny screaming, tiny screaming, tiny screaming. Yeah. It's like, geez wow, you know, thousands of people are dying, but it's hilarious, you know? But it still doesn't explain how the people ended up impaled on the tree. She said that part was a lie. Couldn't regulate my emotions, I couldn't control my powers. Please stop growing, please stop growing. Tried to evacuate the morals, but they were too afraid of me. Why didn't you just leave them to their own devices? They would have run away. I didn't go into a bloodlust fueled rage. I didn't impale anyone. So that just came out of nowhere. No, she said, I know their deaths are my fault, but I didn't go into a bloodlust-fueled rage. So who cares? Yeah. Who cares what your emotional state was at the time, unless you're, like, a domestic abuse victim who's, like, killing your abuser, your emotional, or somebody, that's only a defense if it's, like, self-defense. Yeah. The emotional state of the defendant is only relevant when it's, like, in, if they killed in self-defense because they thought they were uh, um, at reasonable risk of being killed. Yeah, there was no way for them to escape. No, but uh, it's crucially, it's true. crucially not even, like, it's not objective, it's subjective. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, oh, objectively they had a fear for their life. It could be completely subjective, as in, uh, I had a, I have a pathological fear of dogs, and this guy was coming up to me with a giant mastiff. Yeah. So I unloaded my magnum into him, you know? But, but also, you, in some jurisdictions, you have to prove that unless you, there was no other way for you to escape, because you're supposed to run away before you react. Yeah, in some, jur too. in some jurisdictions, but I'm saying, like, the emotional state actually does play a role in that defense. Yeah. Where it's like, if you reasonably thought that you were at risk of death, yeah. and it's you, if, if the defendant reasonably thought that they were at risk of death, it depends on what they were feeling at the time, yeah. and whether or not that's reasonable. But in some states, yeah, they do have to actually make an attempt to escape before, yeah. um unloading into the the victim yeah depending on where it is and but so, here it's like she killed she committed genocide so i was like what is your whether or not you were in a blood bloodlust fueled rage what does that have to do with anything you still committed the act yeah that's not a defense if you were crying that's not a defense you know you still killed them she could have turned around and walked home yeah she didn't she killed more people than she needed to because she kept chasing after them yeah that's what that's what happened at the end of the day if anything it's like a smoking gun no if anything it's like it po pokes a huge hole in her argument of, like, if you said you didn't mean to do any of this, then after killing the first person, why didn't you just walk away? Yeah. Because you knew you couldn't control your powers. Yeah. She walked towards the city. Just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So she continues to say, you must think I'm the biggest hypocrite in the world after I lectured you about that satyr's eyeball. No, I just think it's a retcon. 
<laughs> that satyr's name was Alex. I know, right? <laughs> right. I love black people. MAGA loves the black people. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. And it's not just Mexicans, and I have a great relationship with Mexico and with Mexicans. I have a, an absolutely great relationship. I have so many Jewish friends that are supporting Obama, and I'm saying, are you crazy? <laughs> that black guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that satyr. <laughs> yeah, so um, he says, I'm disgraceful. And then Hades offers her his handkerchief. Not the 3,000 drachma dog handkerchief that disappeared into the void. Yeah. And he says, you say disgraceful. And then he says something that would make me scared. He says, I say powerful. <laughs> and he's like, Hades, I just committed genocide. Oh, wow. That makes me like you even more. Oh, jeez. So he says, so that's why you wanted to give coins to Shades. And why you asked me about getting Shades out of the underworld. And she, to be fair, she does look afraid in that panel. But then she says, you remember that? And it's just goofy, one pupil way bigger than yeah, the other. Yeah, I know, right? He says, well, not exactly. And so she's referring to the memory from the videotape. Yeah, he's he's referring to the memory from, from the videotape. Yeah. And so she's got to be, like, on the table right now when she gets up in his face. And he, he decides to show her the video. So then we cut back to the living room when he's putting the tape in. And he says, uh, Hecate gave me this letter, your letter. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have read it. And he says, I wanted to know how much on a scale of 1 to 10, how much I embarrassed myself when we met. No. That's a convenient excuse. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't even have to say that. No. You don't need to give a justification, but, um... No, the biggest question in my mind is how come he isn't asking her, why didn't you tell me that we've met before? Yeah. Especially when she gives such a shady explanation of the act of wrath. Yeah. I would be like... A, how come you didn't tell me that we'd met before? And B, how much did you know about your mother's conspiracy to hide this, which directly impacts my realm? Yeah, so, again, it's the problem where... It, it would make me think that she planned all of this. Exactly. But it's, like, the problem that we were talking about previously, where it's, like, the characters with the knowledge they have, they're not, like, responding to or bringing up the correct things that they should be from, yeah. like, a narrative perspective. Like... We don't care how embarrassed you were when you first met her. What you should be thinking is we've met before, but you never told me. And I wanted to know why, because I have no memory of that whatsoever. Yeah. So I wanted to see the circumstances under which we met. And it turns out it was a really important, serious circumstance, because you're directly asking about the act of wrath, right? And that's a big deal. And this is just juvenile. Yeah, no, and like, she even teases that when he reads the letter. He's like, it makes me wonder how what else she's hiding. Yeah, like, it's a mystery, right? It's a, It was a, supposed to be a mystery, but then it ended up just being a fluffy moment, and Hades himself doesn't even seem to care that she lied to him this entire time. No, and it, he couldn't even put it together between uh, the, the memory and the fact that you've got these accusations about the act of wrath. And that and... she, there was a conspiracy to hide the influx of shades into the underworld. Yeah. So... Like, she's involved in this conspiracy, dude. And you don't seem to care. It's very dissatisfying. You would think that after hearing about it, he would be, like, his reaction would be much different, but it's not. It's just so. like, oh, that's okay. It's like Rachel was like, uh, I don't want to have to show this again. Let's just get to the good stuff of them watching the video together. Yeah. Because that happens in the exact same, this is the, like, the, the tail end of her tale of woe. And we just do a smash cut to cute fluffy times on the couch. It's such a whiplash, and it's so much like... Oh yeah, don't pay attention to that bit over there. Persephone being depressed over the act of wrath, immediately gone. Yeah. Because we can't have that hanging over the fluffy scene like a cloud. No, so he goes on to say, he's, he's stuttering now. So, so I asked the fates to give me a tape of the memory that I couldn't remember. And then she says a tape. So this panel of her saying a tape is just padding. Yeah, it's mostly padding. Yeah. yeah, here, another padding panel where it's like you could have just had this in one panel. Yeah. And then dot, dot, dot. I shouldn't have done that either. But you already said he already said I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. Let's um, watch it. And... Just relayed one of her most traumatic memories. And then like she's doing the ooh woo faces here. And it's just like, I'm not letting you off that easily. Dude, come on, you just told your tale of woe. Aren't you a little bit like a little bit upset about the fact that you committed genocide like you were claiming to be like five minutes ago? Yeah, neither of them seem very upset. And that's another thing, like, there are some things that are just pure fluff, and they're great, right? Like, uh, 
things that don't get too heavy. Uh, free. Iwatobi Swim Club is like so lightweight. I mean, your brain barely <laughs> registers. Uh, the, the the beautiful animation, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's so many things like that. You just watch it because it looks nice. It's pretty. And, and it's, it's not It's not too... Um, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Yeah. So out of context, it's it's appealing. And it's like cute to have two people who like each other where somebody is like a little awkward and shy and the other person's kind of goading them on and teasing them. It's a pleasant interaction to see. And I know a lot of people read Lore Olympus for those interactions. But I don't understand why it couldn't have just been 100% that. I think that's that would have made the series so much better. Yeah. Because you wouldn't have, like, higher stakes and higher plot points uh, jacking up fan expectations yeah. higher. And then when it's completely dropped and, like, totaled, then you have this, you know, fall to earth where it's like, wow, this series, like, sucks, you know? Yeah. If she just kept it, like, you know, episode 1 to 40... Which is just Hades and Persephone talking on the phone. Actually, no, there is a sexual assault in episode 24. Yeah. If you cut out the sexual assault and then kept the same tone as, like, episode 1 through 40, that would have been so much more enjoyable, I think, for the fans, too. Yeah. Like, for the fans of this type of Lore Olympus, I don't think people who are, like, super fans of the series ever read it for this heavier plot stuff. They read it for the characterization and the way that the characters interacted earlier. Like, a lot of people said, I really liked, you know, Eros and Psyche. Yeah. That's not, that That was like an element of, of the comic that was not too heavy. There weren't large stakes. There weren't world-ending Marvel villain stakes, yeah. you know? Yeah, There was no, like, mystery or anything like that. It was just, like, cute interactions and cute couples. Like, why not just freaking boyfriends? Just make it, like, boyfriends. Yeah, or, like, you know, Disney movies, right? Like, Hercules, the movie doesn't really have... Hercules has more stakes and a greater plot resolution than Laura Olympus does. It does, but for the most part, right, the, the stuff that Rachel obviously enjoyed about it wasn't the stuff about, like, what does it mean to be a hero if you don't have power? I like... wouldn't even compare this to Disney because pretty much every Disney movie has, like, themes, a hero's journey, like, every single one after, like, The Little Mermaid. Yeah. Even Snow White. Even though it's archetypal, like, archetypical, like, Cinderella and Snow White even then have, like, heavier themes. So I wouldn't even compare it to that. I would literally compare it to, um, Iwatobi Swim Club or, like, K-On. Yeah. Like, those, like, cute girls doing cute things shows. Yeah. But, like, for a female audience. Like, Downton Abbey started off like that, but then they tried to get Oh, God. <laughs> Downton Abbey did the same thing where they tried to, like, put Hitler in the show. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Why? I never watched Downton Abbey to, like, have Hitler, you know, making a serious impact on the characters' lives. I, I never asked for this. I, I never asked for Hitler. I didn't get that far into Downton Abbey. Um, I'm afraid you're in for some rigorous debate. I wish I weren't. Shall we go in? I'm not sure that's a true representation of the case. Exactly. There are many benefits to be had from the plan. But benefits for whom? Goodness. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... I'll call the ambulance. Keep him warm. Take my coat. What is it? His ulcer has burst. What? Jack Hitler. Hitler. Oh my god. Everyone's talking about him. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Downton Abbey was good when it was just like, oh, the rose competition for growing roses. Oh, what is the weekend? The Dowager Countess is coming to visit. He's Dumbledore. using the wrong fork. <laughs> How can Mary ever marry him? Yeah, so uncouth. <laughs> I never minded, and I knew the whole time that yeah. he was gay. <laughs> but yeah, Downton Abbey was just fluff for the longest time, and it was fine, because you just watch it really for like the set pieces and the clothes. I watch it for the clothes. The clothes are really good. Yeah. And then um, there's like some drama in there uh but yeah you just watch it for the clothes and like the cinematography low the cinematography is really good yeah low it's something drama. you put on in the background when you're like drawing your comic or whatever but then when they started to, to ramp up the drama i kept watching because it was hilarious because <laughs> they for the wrong them. reasons because yeah. it's like it's like this is a british show that doesn't have a big budget and now they're gonna have like edith like i have to go rescue my child <laughs> And then you have the blind soldier with Thomas. Oh god. And it was just <laughs> unnecessarily tragic. <laughs> no, what about when Thomas tried to like do the black market business and then he kidnapped the dog? I never saw that. Part. You never saw no, that part? I never got that far because I was just sitting there watching it like 
<laughs> but yeah, if if Lore Olympus had just stayed like a low stakes, <laughs> fun, fluffy drama, it could have been great, right? It could have been like Bridgerton. Yeah, it could you have could been. Focus on a different myth and a different couple every season. Yeah, that way because if Rachel doesn't like being criticized for stuff like that, then I don't understand why she would try to attempt doing something that. It's, and it's can't. clearly not something she enjoys. Yeah, because she keeps skipping past all of the trauma and the dramatic moments to get to the fluffy bit. Yeah, because it's not pleasant. She doesn't even like writing it. So no. why does she keep putting in her comic? Yeah, she doesn't like writing the action. She doesn't like writing the drama. She doesn't like making her character suffer. Which is all, like, these are all the ingredients to tell a good story. So why would you put it in your story? A serious story, right? Like, something like a, serious... Yeah, no, like, a good serious story yeah. requires stakes and suffering. Yeah. And if you're not going to torture your main character, then there's no stakes. Right. You have to have them hit a low point before you see them climbing out, and that's, like, really satisfying. Like, she would never be able to, like, pull off an attack on Titan with characters dying left, right, and center. And, like, she shouldn't have to. No. And it's like, why didn't you just stick to fluff? Yeah. You know, you could have had a really good like, pleasant series, and you wouldn't have lost all your fans' goodwill if you'd never deviated from the fluff in the first place. Yeah. So, you got- She just got too big for her britches. I mean, I guess she just wanted to try it out without really understanding that it's like, no, you gotta- you gotta stick the landing, otherwise- I think she thought if it was just fluff, it would never be taken, like, as this huge, epic, serious thing, but it's like, she never wanted to write a huge, epic, serious thing. If you look at her early interview, she was just excited to get to the fluff. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, you got Persephone with the confetti here saying, oh my gods, and Hades in the background saying, oh my gods, as he's covering his face. And it's like, out of context, again, this is like a cute, pleasant interaction, but knowing what we've just seen with the act of wrath. It's it, like, it makes her come across as a sociopath. Talented Mr. Ripley. <laughs> exactly. Right? So she points to the TV and with says... With the worst uwu face yeah, ever. Yeah, and it's like... On the night where she was actually talking to Hades about that, you would think she was, she'd was she be really melancholy and upset. Well, she remembers this night. This was the night that she was really upset because she just killed people and she wanted to know if she could bring them back to life. And she just told this story to Hades. So why is she so, like, peppy and hyper? It's like either she has, like, the memory of a piece of bread dough where you put a fingerprint in it and then it just rises back up, or she's a sociopath who feels nothing. Yeah. Like, it's really weird. Yeah, so then... A comedy as as the image changes and she's pointing at Hades' crotch, and she says, "Oh, sorry, Your Majesty." And he says, "So you remember all of this?" And she goes, "Yup, that's news to me because again, never seen, never saw any ever." Of this. Um, and he says, "If you remember, p perhaps you don't need to watch this." And she goes, "But this is the best part." And Her face looks so creepy in that panel. Yeah, she starts laughing, you know, raffle the mouth as she sees where she rendered Hades infertile. But it's not funny. Yeah, I mean, the context again is like, what are you guys doing? Like, this is not funny. Like, it's like Aunt May and the bread all over again. What are you guys doing? <laughs> Except in that case, it was two different characters who were removed from Aunt May's death. This is the same characters. These are the same characters who are just talking about death. Yeah. So, he's all sprawled out, ashamed, and she goes, come on, Hades, you have to admit, it's pretty funny. We're idiots. And it's like, speak for yourself. Yeah, and so he shuffles and he goes, no, you're a radiant goddess. I'm the idiot. And again, this is, I just, I don't it's know how padding. many times. There's like three panels where yeah. nothing is said. And so, I'm sorry, but you know, I have to give you at least a little bit of grief over that tape. And he says, oh no, I deserve it. I'm truly sorry about the letter and the tape. And the dog comes over and she goes, I'm sorry about committing treason. Undercut. Wow, that's so blasé. But uh, even more blasé, undercutting the tension in three, two, one, because the dog sits down and then farts right after she says that. And it's like, that's like something that would be in a baby movie. That's like, that's like the Tropic Thunder. Do you remember the fake commercials before Tropic yeah, Thunder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have Jack, Jack Black, Black in a movie about people farting. <laughs> This summer, Jeff Portnoy, Jeff Portnoy, Jeff Portnoy, and Jeff Portnoy are the Fatties, part two, letting loose this summer. No, not only that, it's like, it feels like Rachel was struggling with this chapter and didn't know how to write the fallout of this revelation and make it serious. So she just bookended it with a fluffy scene with dog fart jokes because she's like, I don't know how to write this, so I'm just gonna totally cut to something totally different. 
and then just make it cute and funny. This has to because be... I have no idea what to write. Yeah, this has to be uh, really. And then you just get a weird, like, uncanny zoom in. Like, what is this face? I don't know. It's so creepy. It's gonna haunt my nightmares. It's like, especially. It's not funny. No, given the context, it's especially not funny. It's really, it's, it's bizarre. It's like disturbing. Like, not to be dramatic, but it's like, <laughs> I'm disturbed reading this. Like, is, is the mindset of the person who wrote this that, like, detached from what you just Genocide. wrote? Genocide. It's like you're just making it even more of a thing that we shouldn't take seriously. Yeah. And if then, you're going to cut from, like, the horrible thing that happened that's so traumatic for these characters and cut to a dog fart joke, it's like you're, like, you're making fun of your own series at this point. You're undercutting your own series. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, that's probably going to have to be cut, but it reminds me of the interview where, where Rachel said, in, in order to write these traumatic scenes, I have to imagine them happening to myself. She's obviously never committed genocide, so she can't write it. She can't write it. She can't, she physically or mentally is incapable of putting herself in another person's shoes. And that's, you know, that's sympathy. So she's not able to sympathize with somebody who would be in this situation. But furthermore, she can't even empathize. Like, she, she, forget about sympathy. Um, sympathy is one thing, but sympathy is the precursor to empathy, where it's like you don't have to imagine yourself in your shoes to imagine what that's like. She can't do that. She's incapable no. of doing that. So if I were to write this scene, I would have, I would first of all write Persephone completely differently. If she has the memory of the act of wrath hanging over her this whole time, she would not be like this innocent little cinnamon roll who's like not cynical at all. You know, this is like, this character is literally like a sociopath. Like it feels like, a, or she would be wearing a mask the whole time and yeah. in denial. But like this character does not match with her actions and her past at all. Um, so first of all, I would change her entire character. And second of all, if she's admitting to the act of wrath that she committed, and this is the first time she's admitting it out loud to anyone besides her mother, she should be, like, crying in a ball in front of the TV, and Haiti should be like, it's okay, it's okay, we'll get through this somehow. She's like, I feel like such a horrible person, I haven't told anyone for months, you must think I'm a terrible person, blah blah blah, I should have told Zeus, I deserve the punishment. There's nothing like that. Nothing like that. It's almost like she doesn't even care. No. It's like, oh, well, I was crying when it happened, so that makes it okay. I don't have to show any contrition now. No, what would have been better, actually, is if after Zeus issued that arrest warrant, she showed up and went straight to Zeus and said, okay, I'm ready to pay for my It was punishment. Demeter's idea. I wanted yeah. to turn myself in all along. Exactly. I'm turning myself in, and then Hades would be the one who has to defend her. Yeah. And then he'd be setting up the stakes for the trial arc. Because yeah. Persephone doesn't want help. No. And then he would have to even talk her into getting representation. She'd yeah. be like, I deserve it. I deserve it for what I did. Yeah. And then, if you wanted it to be stupid Eris, which was the dumbest plot twist ever, Hades would be like, you've been set up. That actually wasn't your fault. It's a conspiracy. That would have been way more interesting. So it does end up actually being Ares? Yes. Oh my god. Dang it. So everything Hermes said about a goddess committing an act of wrath might be his flavor, that's not even true. No, it's because a, it's, it's retconned to be Ares later. It's not even her doing it. No. It's not even her agency. No. So the feeling is really somebody else using her like a proxy. Yeah. But wouldn't it have been more interesting if she turned herself in and then Hades was like, JFK style getting to the bottom of it and he yeah. found out that the whole thing was a setup. Yeah, especially because you have these tapes that record memories omnisciently. He could be like, what you're telling me doesn't make sense with what Helios is telling me. And then so he, you could, know what? he could go to the fates to find the archive and the archive's been erased. Yeah. Like friggin' Star Wars. That would mean that the archive has been erased. <laughs> Master? Because someone erased it from the archive memory. Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. Ugh, that's so stupid that it was Eris all along. That's no, like, but that would have been interesting, though. Yeah, I mean, if you want to go with that, but that's... So I mean, bad. you have to go with that, because it's not like I can rewrite it at this point. Like, I am going to rewrite it, but it's not like you can... If you wanted to keep this plot, yeah. but still make her sympathetic and lead directly to the trial arc, you could have had hate her turn herself in, and then Hades has to prove her innocent, and he's so convinced of her innocence, because he's like, this is so out of character for you, and you said you were a master, but then one day your powers just failed and stopped yeah. working? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And then he finds out that it was Ares. Boom, trial arc, you get the Pelican Brief type right. deal, John Grisham novel. So, I guess... And Presemni would come off sympathetic instead of sociopathic, too, yeah. in, that, in that rendition. I guess then, since it was Ares who did the Act of Wrath, then the whole thing about her powers going out of control with strong emotions. That's not Eris. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, I don't think I ever got that far because that was revealed in the trial arc. 
Oh, you, you skipped patches? I skipped, I skipped portions. Okay. And I, like, sped read it because it was so boring. Right on. I guess we'll find out together then. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, she's saying, ha ha, Hades, ha ha ha. More padding. She looks at him. And she goes, thanks for being on my side. She's talking where did, to the Where did dog. the dog come from? I don't know. But, I mean, thanks for being on my side. And the dogs disappear in the next panel. Yeah, you have every right to be furious with me. Instead, you offer your home to me. It's all part of the plan. Yeah, it's like master manipulation. It's like she she knew this would happen. That's why she disappeared, because she knew it would... Like, if she had just come to Hades with her version of the act of wrath before she disappeared, he never would have swallowed it. So it reads to me like she disappeared knowing that Thanatos and Apollo and, and, and um, Thetis and Minthi were finding out about her act of wrath somehow. So she disappeared, engineered her disappearance, and we only see, like, maybe an hour of that from her point of view when she checks into the motel, and then we see her at the pawn shop, and then we see her right when she gets the arrest warrant uh, of the Act of Wrath. Because we're basically missing, you know, we're, we're missing um, 24 hours from her perspective, right? So we're missing the bits where she, like, you know, plants this information in front of Zeus or whatever and engineers it so that by the time Hades learns of this information from Zeus... He's already so concerned about her missing because he finds her after they have that meeting. Yeah. He's already so concerned about her missing that he's willing to forgive whatever she did because he's more concerned about her missing than he is about all of these allegations that Zeus is coming to him with. Yeah. So it just feels like she engineered the whole situation knowing that if she went missing for 48 hours before it came out, that Hades would be more likely to forgive her for it even though she committed treason against him and a conspiracy and then that he would let her live in his house afterwards. Yeah, it's very much like Gone Girl. It's very much like Gone Girl. Or Sherry Papini. Mm -hmm. The California mom who faked her 2016 disappearance was sentenced to 18 months in prison, more than double what prosecutors asked for. Hey, good morning, George. The judge calling a very tearful Sherry Papini a manipulator. And that stiff sentence ending a six-year saga. But it also allowed for a trove of evidence used against her to be unsealed. That included images of the severe beating she inflicted on herself and a shocking video in which police finally confront her with the truth. Real life case. Yeah. Check it out. It's crazy. Um, and it, it just makes for a character who seems very manipulative and petty and very... Especially considering we never see her thoughts during that entire time frame. Yeah. And she was picking out apartments. Yeah, she's like Alice, Alice Morgan from Luther. Mm -hmm. uh, prodigy turned mastermind criminal. And she, no, and the real reason for her anyway is because she got bored. There's yeah. nobody to manipulate. Yeah, so that's that's the headcanon now. I, I needed I needed more status. Nobody knew who I was, so I had to come here, Hades. Zodiac. I wanted I didn't want to live in the mortal realm. I want to live in a mansion. I want the fate the streets to be plastered with my face. Yeah, you know. So she gets a Gone Girl near, uh, monologue. Yeah, she even looks sinister in this panel. She looks sinister in a lot of these panels. But Hades continues. He says, "Corey, you you've always treated me well, and mind you, they've only known each other for a week and a half." The only time she treated him well was when she got in Baklava. Yeah. And that was really just a manipulation. Yeah, because, more manipulation because, like, she, I mean, she was nicer to him when he was with Minthy than she is when he's single, right? And so, um, in fact, since the time he's broken up with Minthy, she went to Tartarus, right, um, without his permission, mm -hmm. which is headache in a handbasket, mm -hmm. and then she went missing. Again, another headache in a handbasket. And, um... It's, it's almost like she was really nice to him and, like, enticing him when he was in a relationship with someone else, when he would have little reason to look her way. And now that he's, like, got her, she's making his life more difficult. Yeah. With the, the promise of returning to how she was when, they, when he was with Mithy. Yeah. Like, a real, like, a manipulative, you know, emotional abuser would do. Right. Like... The, the type of people who act really sweet in the first couple months of a relationship and then always, like, uh, breadcrumb that they'll go back to that time. Yeah. But in the meantime, treat you like absolute dirt. Well, they're just being very dramatic and they're making you feel very anxious all the time by doing things for the point of making you feel anxious, Well, right? not only that, they, they want your undivided attention. Yeah. At all times. Like, constantly. I think um, <clears throat> Minthy not answering his texts for dinner when she's out with Thetis is like microscopic compared to going missing for two days or to going to Tartarus. To yeah, you want to talk about emotional days. manipulation, man. Yeah. Like, it's ironic that Persephone comes across as far more emotionally manipulative than Minthy ever was. Yeah. Minthy almost seemed like she wore a heart on her sleeve. 
not that she was manipulative, more like she was too blunt. And yeah. she didn't know how to handle her emotions. Especially because Rachel actually goes back and fills in what was actually going on with Minty mm -hmm. when she missed those texts, and mm -hmm. it was a sympathetic reason. Mm -hmm. We see what Persephone is doing when she was missing. She was thinking about decorating apartments. She never called Hades to tell him she was okay, never went to a payphone, never showed up to work. Yeah. She could have still gone to work. Why didn't she go to work? Especially because you pointed this out earlier. She pawned the comb when she didn't really need to. Mm -hmm. And him finding the comb didn't lead to him finding her. No. It just made him worry more. Yeah. So the whole thing is not looking very good. And then she thing. knew that there were only seven and a half pawn shops in Olympus. So she, she specifically pawned the comb and went like, Oh, I only have these two things, knowing that the comb was worth far more than Demeter's brooch. So she knew that if Hades went looking for her, there's only seven and a half pawn shops. So he's going to see the comb. Yeah. And she has the handkerchief. She could have just returned the handkerchief at the Chinese ghost town. Yeah. So I don't know why she pawned the comb. Yeah, but I mean... Yeah, it all just looks like she's, like, setting things up so that Hades is, like, constantly worrying about her. Yeah, he, he's just becoming an, a, a knot of anxiety and dread. And so he goes on to say, You're not ashamed to be seen with me in public or to be in a photograph with me or to sleep next to me. Nymphie slept next to you. Yeah. And I, I don't get where this, like, not ashamed to be seen with me in public. They've only been seen in public together, like, twice. Twice. So, and then, or to be in a photograph with me. It's very naive, idealistic, premature declarations of something that is, like, a lot more serious. But, I mean, the setup is just not there. And so he says, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm always going to be in your corner because you're nice to me. You make me feel good. You she And, and they she's known him for basically almost two weeks yeah and he's gonna be in her corner because she was nice to him a handful of times and it's like it's like the same thing where it's like nobody res nobody respects me except for hades what about hermes what about um artemis what about hestia you know i guess not hestia but uh, hera you know daphne daphne and then with hades it's like nobody was ever nice to me but it's like your brothers aren't mean to you Hera wasn't mean to you. You were in, in an affair with her for centuries. Yeah. She was never abusive to him. Megara wasn't mean to him. Yeah. Like, Minty, you could argue, like, she didn't know how to handle her emotions, so she blew up at him and it wasn't a good relationship. But it's like, as far as we know, there was nothing wrong with him and Hera. Yeah. So, like, where is this, like, sad emo boy never been in a relationship energy coming from? Yeah, it doesn't make sense for a 2,000-year-old being. And so he says, you shared a lot of personal information about yourself today. Maybe I should share some things as well. And now he's like, okay, that's enough talking from you. I don't right. want to hear about you anymore. You you, you shut up, right? It's about <laughs> me now. This is the Hades show now. So you shut up. <laughs> They're both narcissists. <laughs> she looks at him like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't sign up for that. <clears throat> and so he goes, things I've never talked about before. And that's the end of 132. <clears throat> so this is episode 133, and the first thing we get is a stupid content warning. Probably because of, um, Kronos, right? Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah. This is the this is the episode that has four in it. <laughs> <laughs> and this, isn't it, like, the same episode or the episode after where Hades is like, can you get big again? <laughs> so I can live out my trauma with Kronos. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's um, his coping mechanism. <laughs> I think it's the next one. I think it's the next, <laughs> next chapter after this one. Hey. <clears throat> so Hades continues things I've never talked about before, and then he goes only if you want to, of course. I don't know why she keeps having the characters looking off to the side, but then their eyes are like disappearing. Yeah. So it looks like they're like possessed by Pazuzu. He looks like yeah, scanners. Right yeah, it's really forward. it's really weird. <sighs> oh God, this panel's even worse. I'm scared. It's a repaste of a panel from last chapter. <laughs> it is, where he says, like... Because I remember that cauliflower Cheeto ear. Yeah, um, but he's got the weird eyeball, and she's saying some things like crimes. Why is she getting so sparkly-eyed over him committing crimes? Like, did she secretly like when he pulled that guy's eyebrow, uh, eyeball out? That's what Aries said. Wasn't that... Was that why she had the, like, floral explosion in the hospital? <laughs> Could have been. I mean, who knows what she would have been doing during the actual, like, taking it out. I mean, that's just putting it back in. If that's what seeing gore does to her. Oh, God! <laughs> She's a sociopath. Oh, she's scary. I'm, I'm, I would like if Persephone was actually scary. That would be very interesting. To be refreshing. Events. Yeah, like if he actually, she's like, well, now that I know something, now that you know something about me, I want to know something about you. And she like escalates and keeps doing like these creepy, like She was like things. talented Mr. Ripley mixed with like Lady Macbeth. Everybody should have one talent. What's yours? Forging signatures. Uh, telling lies. Impersonating practically anybody. Do an impression. Now? 
The only talent my son has is for cashing his allowance. Oh, I like to sail. Believe me, I love to sail. Instead, I make boats. Stop! Other people sail them. It's too much. You're making all the hairs on my neck stand up. Yeah, you know, something scary like that would have been very interesting. Um, but I don't think that's what the intent is here. Oh, side note, by the way, what happened to her flower crown? Shouldn't it be, like, shouldn't she have a flower crown since this is a fluffy scene of babies? No. I think, is this when it just stops appearing? I guess. I mean, let's, let's keep an eye on that. Yeah. No, like, about my childhood. Oh. Da da da, da da da, wasted panels. I guess I'm going to tell you now, it's a little harder than I thought. Don't look at me. Well, it's a little harder than he thought. Ugh. <laughs> fluff, bluff, pointless. His eye looks friggin' weird in this panel. Yeah. This is all pointless, it's not funny. Look at his mouth. I know, oh my god! <laughs> it looks like somebody, somebody carved a hangnail into his jaw. <laughs> and so then they teleport. I feel like this was in something, where they constantly teleport. Was and the other characters like getting nauseous and saying, please. Was it in like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh, it could have been. Let me look that up. That's an easy one to find. Gladly. He's in Norway. Just seeing whether this thing can... Nope. Oh, we don't need that. No. And then she goes, wait, wait, wait. Oh my god, what's wrong with this? I was waiting for you to see it. <laughs> oh my god! The, the, both of their faces are really strange. It's really becoming like telling that we're having these references like almost every episode now. Yeah. And then she says, I got an idea. And then uh, this episode is called Wealth. Why is it called Wealth? Is she running out of episode title ideas? Because the last one was called Handkerchief and it had <laughs> nothing to do with anything. Yeah. I don't know. This one could have been <clears throat> called um, My Youth or something or... Time. And then, uh, is this better? Yes, thank you for being so accommodating. <laughs> behind a bookshelf. Creepy eye in the bookshelf. Blah, blah, blah. Make what seem easy? Talking about myself? Yes. Wasted panel. You're not afraid of being vulnerable. I wouldn't say that's true. There's plenty of things I'd prefer to smoosh away forever. We never see that. We never see, like, into her head ever, so this is a lie. Um, I just talk a lot, so it makes it seem like I'm a master of communication. Yeah, but you talk a lot. But you don't say much. You just ask invasive questions like a child. And then when it comes to like your internal monologue, you have none. So it almost seems like there's nothing on your mind at all. Yeah, I mean, she still hasn't told Hades about Apollo. I, I mean, she doesn't have to, but I think it's like... She hasn't told anyone about Apollo. No. Even Eros only knew the information because he could, like, tell. Because he's, like, their powers are sick. Yeah, I guess, I mean, yeah, I don't know. This bookshelf is leaning and it's bothering me. Yeah, no snap to grid. So he goes at him and he looks very old. Really weird in that panel too. His nose, jeez. And, and his and his hand. A very pulpy hand. <laughs> a pulpy gorilla hand. Because I should start with my parents. Oh boy, strap yourself in. He's just Kronos is like the frowny face emoji here. <laughs> yeah. He says my parents, but you only see Kronos. Yeah, and this then... is like a really crappy attempt at Rachel's old style. Yeah, it's just smack dab in the middle, panel with some brushes. King Kronos did not want ears. Contrary to this, he did want the Titaness, Rhea. What's how is that contrary to not wanting ears? You can like be in a relationship and not have kids. Does Does Rachel know that? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, she doesn't have kids. No, she doesn't. So she should know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you get, like, th these, like, horrible, and this is, like, a thing that happens later on in the comic, these horrible, like, brush strokes that are trying to be, like, light rays. Yeah. But they're all colliding, and they look like pieces of spaghetti that got on the film. Yeah, they're very thin. They're very, they're way too thin to be effective, and none of them are in the same direction. No. It's, like, horrible. Like, this, these rays are one of the worst parts of modern Laura Olympus. And it's very distracting. It's awful. And she says, and for some unknown reason... She wanted him too, and then you cut to a baby. Yeah, the baby has nothing to do with the, the speech bubble. No. Just cut to a baby in the void. So I was born because she wanted him too. Doing the the Christian, you know, <laughs> Jesus on a cross. <laughs> the Christian, you know, whatever it is. Baby Hades died for your sins. Oh my they didn't God. even color it as a rope. It's the same place.
place is a dingle dangle. No, that, that rope is actually the umbilical cord. Oh my god. I'll have you know. We have to cut all of that. Why does he have fish eyes? Like, his eyes are creepy. Yeah, they're very shiny. They're like fish eyes. They look like fish eyes. Yeah. So I was born as a natural consequence. I was born to be the god of wealth. Kronos constantly wanted to get rid of me, but Rhea would always convince him to keep me a little longer. Just a side note, he says I was born to be a god of wealth, and that's like directly contrasting with Persephone's I was born to be a goddess of spring. Yeah. But in her telling of being born to be a goddess of spring, we cut to a picture of her as an adult, fully formed grown woman standing there like... Yeah, that's with a, true. With crossed eyes That's like this. true. And then we get to see Hades as a little baby, but we don't get to see Persephone as a little you baby. You know, in the Greek myths, um, the gods grow up really fast. So, like, Apollo, I think in, in his myth, he grows up, like, within a couple months. And Aphrodite was supposed to take care of him, because I think I think Zeus wanted to kill him or something uh, when he was born. And uh, so Aphrodite took care of him, but then she fell in love with him within a few months. That's just Greek myth. But you know what? I think the reason Hades is a baby in this in this scene is to engender more sympathy for him when he gets eaten by Kronos. Yeah. It's basically so that she can show the little kid imagery, little kid being abused imagery over and over again to make you feel bad for him and like him as a character. Yeah. It's just a lazy, manipulative shortcut, basically. <clears throat> so he says, Kronos constantly wanted to get rid of me, but Rhea would always convince him to keep me a little longer. I love those early days, and I love spending time with my mother. She's just literally blowing smoke up his ass. <laughs> yeah. And now we know why he's such a prick. Yeah. <laughs> you can cut that too. <laughs> I know people say she was vapid and out of her depth, an idiot for forming a union with Kronos. I kind of agree. I, I agree mean, too. What's there to like about the guy? He Seriously. seems like a mega dude. No, not only that, it's he, like in his narration, he <laughs> says it didn't matter that he didn't want kids because he wanted the Titaness Rhea, and he never talks about how she felt she feels about him. It's like, he wanted Rhea, so he ended up with Rhea. You know, that's all that matters. Why is his head so much bigger than hers? Because he's a man. And his neck is like four times as thick. Yeah. I think maybe he was good once. Oh my god, this is such a lazy copy-paste. They were staring at each other menacingly, and now she's like, doing like a weird, snobby British lady laugh. Oh! Yeah! <laughs> what is this? Yeah. And then... He says, it wasn't her fault that he lost it over time. People can say what they want about her, but I knew her, and she was kind. And she looked exactly like you, Persephone. Always. He's Christian Grey. Yeah, by the time of my sixth birthday, the words my mother used to convince my father to spare me no longer worked. Just say he grabbed you when you were six, man. And so he ate me. Yeah, he's like a baby in this panel, specifically to make him look e extra sympathetic. Yeah, because if it was big, fridge-sized, cronk, Hades, Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, Dr. Followed, Manhattan. It wouldn't have been as scary. This composition is so bad. It reminds me of the, the Hypnos panel later in the latest episode, where he looks like he's in the spin cycle. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I'm like, why is this cape so long? I don't know, who dresses a baby like that? I know! And the baby's face is so derpy. Like, Dude. one eyelid is, like, far more squinted than the other. Kronos only caught... And he's just doing this. Like, he's yeah. not, like, reaching out. He's, like, doing this. Kronos only caught the baby because of the stupid because outfit Because of the long place. cape. Rhea wanted to get rid of it, too. Yeah, didn't she listen to Edna? No capes. Something classic. Like, uh, Dinah Guy. Oh, he had a great look. Oh, the cape and the boots. No capes. And so... Then I was alone. I was alone for 13 years. Oh, boo-hoo. How old are you? This is like 2000. So 13 is like in the blink of an eye. Seriously, and it happened 2000 years ago. <clears throat> Correction, I was alone with Kronos for 13 years. He knew I was there and sometimes he would talk to me. And that's such a creepy... I know! <laughs> like, of all the ways to show that, that's like not... Like, okay, because you know in Attack on Titan, Eren gets eaten by a Titan, Yeah. Him, right? And you have him inside the Titan, and you don't do that. Because you know who does that? People who like Vor <laughs> do that. So, I mean, it's so much more atmospheric. If you wanted to make it, like, you don't have to show it, because in Attack on Titan, it's a lot more like a biological thing. Right. Like sitting in right. stomach juices. This is much more, this, the, this sequence where he's, like, floating in liquid, 
is much more atmospheric and terrifying. The inside of Kronos should be a little bit more inspired than just being red. I think it would be really interesting because Kronos is the god of time, and he's a titan, and he looks like uh, the cosmos. Yeah. It'd be really interesting if Hades was floating in the void. Yeah. And Rachel loves drawing the void. Yes. <laughs> the one time that the void is okay. Yeah, and you could have had Hades say, like, it was terrifying because there was nothing. And when Kronos wasn't talking to me, it was just vast, empty... Nothing. And I thought I would never leave. And if Kronos wasn't talking to me, sometimes I couldn't hear my own thoughts and I felt like I didn't exist. And I could never, I couldn't feel the passage of time. And since it was nothing, I felt like I was in there for like infinity. Yeah. Those 13 years of my life feel longer than every year afterwards. You know, that I've been alive for 2,000 years. That would have actually made it where I it's like... would have sold it for me. Yeah, 13 years. Okay, you're 2,000 years old, but it, when you put it like that, that actually carries some weight to it. Otherwise, just saying I was there for 13 years and he's a 2,000 year old being, it's like that would be a blink of an eye. No, it should have been like a void. It should have been like a void that was so dark that he couldn't even see his own hand. Sensory deprivation. Yeah, and he's like, I couldn't even see my own hand. I didn't even know if I was alive. And you know, we Greek gods, we don't die. So the thing that we're scared of is death. It's the closest thing a god can come to, to perma death. Yeah. Like, there, I spelled it out. I, I, cl- I, I crystallized the thought and made it far more interesting. And in my rewrite, I'm gonna have the gods be super scared of death because you would be if you were an immortal god! Yeah, yeah, you would. And so that would be so much better than whatever this is. This <laughs> bore imagery. Panel. Just have him be floating in, in perpetual darkness. And so he goes on to say, I hated him, but I was so desperate to have any sort of interaction that it was almost a relief when he would talk to me again. <laughs> you undercut that with this derpy man. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that's, no. No, it should have been, it should have been a longer flashback, and you should have had a few panels of Hades in the void, not even being, being able to see his hand. And then, like, okay, and then it'd be like, I was so desperate to have any sort of interaction. Do you know what that does to a person being locked there? And I was only six years old. I had no idea what was happening to me. And occasionally he would speak to me. And then you would show Hades alone in the void, like crying or like all balled up or whatever. And then you'd have like, my son, you know, yeah. like written over it, like how Rachel used to do when she used to write right. the text over the, the visuals. And then uh, Hades would, you know, uh, he, then he would look up at the source of the sound and then he would have tears coming out of his eyes and he'd be like, father, you know? Yeah. And... It, you could even have it so that Hades is like, it's so messed up that for 13 years I was trapped in that void and the only thing tethering me and, and confirming my existence was Kronos, so I actually loved him. Yeah. Every time he came down to me, I loved him. I worshipped him. I worshipped him. Like he was god. my god. He was the only thing that existed to me. Yeah. You could have done, you could have had so much drama, so much angst, and actually made me feel bad for Hades, but instead we just get this derpy Hades. Yeah, it could have been really scary. And he would really compelling. Like, yeah, he could have been like, that was like the closest I'd ever gone to feeling like mortality the way mortals must feel. Yeah. You know? And So then he, he would actually feel bad for the mortals that Persephone massacred. Yeah. So, and then immediately after that he says, and then one day without warning I was set free. I don't like this visual for him being set free. I think it would have been a lot better if he was, like, looking up and then you see... A purple hand coming down from the sky. Yeah. And Zeus. Like, a lightning bolt or something, right? Like, purple light, and then it's Zeus riding lightning into, into and his And reaching mouth. out to him. Yeah. Because then you would actually get the feeling of indebtedness and gratitude versus this, like, side-scroller panel. I mean, what's Poseidon even I don't doing? know. Both Poseidon and Kronos look like idiots here. Um, it would have been better to see things from Hades POV so that you really get into his psyche of, like, then Zeus saved me, and it was like seeing the sun for the first time, you know? Yeah. And so he said, unfortunately, Kronos didn't want me to leave, so he, for a lack of better description, took a few bites. But are Zeus and Poseidon also Kronos' sons? Yes. But I thought he didn't want any heirs. No, the funny thing about this, and then I mentioned this in the Discord because I started reading up on the myths more um, since the idea for a rewrite came to me, yeah. is that uh, Hera, Demeter, Zeus, Hestia, uh, Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, oh, uh, Hades, uh, all six of them are brother and sister, and they were all the child of Kronos and Rhea, and Kronos ate all of them in the order that they were born. I think Hestia was the first one born. So Hestia was in there the longest. And um, he... Uh, coughed them up in reverse order, and Zeus was the last one born who saved all of them. And uh, it, it's basically interesting that this comic frames it as though only Hades has gone through this trauma. Yeah. 
because when we when Zeus becomes villainized or whatever, or when Hera, you know, has when we switch to Hera's POV, we never see insight into how Kronos affected them. Like, for Hades, it's like his big thing. He always talks about Kronos. People are mistaking me for Kronos. But we never get that from Zeus. Like, to the point that when I read that in the myth, I was confused. Because I was like, if that's true, then how come that never comes up in Lore Olympus? It never comes up in Lore Olympus. It's bizarre. It's like, it's, it's like Hades was the only one who was ever swallowed by Kronos. Yeah. If you never read the myth, you wouldn't even know that those other guys were also sw swallowed by I Kronos. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it plays such a little role in how they act and how they're characterized. Because for Hades, it's like being swallowed by Cronus is like his get out of jail free card. Yes. He always brings it up, you know? So, yeah, it's really interesting that that never comes up. I guess it's like what she chose to keep <clears throat> and what she chose to, um, it's kind of, that, that can stay over there. I'm, no, I'm good, no, you know, keep reading this chapter. You already read this chapter, remember? She, so, she shows that Poseidon has his injury because of Cronus. In this chapter, she reveals that all of them are swallowed by Kronos. No, are you kidding me? Yeah, you read this How chapter. How did I forget that? Because it matters. It doesn't matter at all. It doesn't <laughs> affect their characterization at all, but that's what she reveals in this chapter. Oh, I just read this last week. I know, and I forgot it too, and I'd read it twice, but I forgot right. that Zeus and Poseidon had also been swallowed by Kronos in this in this story. Jeez. I think since Hera, Hestia, and Demeter aren't related to them, it's only Zeus, Poseidon, and Kronos who got swallowed by... Uh, Zeus, Poseidon, and, and Hades who only got swallowed by Kronos. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's why he's got those scars. He goes, I know gods are supposed to heal from injuries, but I believe he cursed me, and that's why it took me so long to heal, and why I was left with scars. Um, once I was out, life was good. Zeus and Hera. No. Very bland background. Yeah. And it's like somebody just drew the characters floating in the void, and then the assistants were like, okay, gotta draw a background for this. And they're walking like Sims. I know. On a walk cycle. Not only did I have a new brother, I had two. Odd. That's such a weird way to phrase things. Yeah. Cronus had consumed Poseidon at an older age. Okay, so there you go. But he had kept this separate for the duration of our imprisonment. I was sorry that he had suffered the same fate as me. Oh my god, she's doing the thing where she's separating a sentence across like multiple panels. It's so annoying. The pacing is so slow. <laughs> but it was nice to have someone who understood the bright sun and the loud sounds of the outside world. Get on with it! Seriously. <laughs> He is able to bounce back much faster than me. Why? Um, because Hades is a sad emo boy. Yeah. Metis once told me that I shouldn't be frustrated by my slow recovery. She said it was because I had more sorrow in my blood. What does that mean? I suppose we would call it trauma now. Only Hades' trauma matters. That's what that means. I don't want to make any assumptions about <coughs> what you're going through. It's just Persephone's wearing you. a totally different dress in this panel. Yeah. It's a totally different dress. The last one was like a, like sheath a maxi. Dress. It was like yeah. a sheath dress. A sheath maxi dress. It's just when I found you, the way you were, reminded me of how I used to react. I can only think about things through myself. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. I only feel bad for you because I used to have the exact same thing. That's why he's in her corner, not because she's I know, nice to him. because she, she reminds him of him. Like, everyone in this comic is a narcissist, bro. Yeah. When I could have sworn, I heard his voice calling out to me, even though he was nowhere in sight. Back then, I couldn't control my body or my powers, either. But that doesn't end up being true, anyway, because we've got that plot twist. Seriously. What I mean is, when you're in it, it feels like it's going to last forever. But it doesn't, and it will get better. But she's not even sorrowful or traumatized. No, she's not traumatized. Nothing sticks in her brain. It's like I said, she's a piece of bread that's well risen. Yeah, she looks like, what are you talking about? Exactly! I'm already over I'm it. confused! Yeah, like, you saw me with the farting dog. I'm over it. Seriously. Does it ever go away? What the heck? I'm not sure. Not completely. But it does get smaller, easier to manage. And he looks like such a weirdo. I know. Panel. I'm so, so, so sorry you had to go through all that. It's r really unfair. Thanks to you for sharing that with me, and then we get a knock knock. I'll go who I'll go see who that is. You just relax, okay? Schmo K. So funny, so charming. Schmo K. Ends up being Hermes, right? He's gonna come back and see the dog dead in the living room. <laughs> yeah, and so it ends up being Hermes, cross-eyed, goofy Hermes. I was just wondering if you'd seen Persephone. What is this Hermes trying to get back into Zeus's good books? Uh, come on, boss. Why so hostile? Why is Hermes wearing, like, a prison outfit? <laughs> no, that's that's the collection from Kanye West's yeah. uh, 
Gap. The Gap. Yeah. He had to dig through a pile to get it. And the dirty clothes that he, Kanye made for Gap. He's a hype, hype beast person. Yeah, and he's all sweaty. I just need to speak with her. You can tell my brother that yes, Persephone is here. And no, I will not be handing her over. It's a lot of assumptions. Oh my god, look at the art assistants. And yet they had that shot of Hades, the boar shot. Yeah, they couldn't they couldn't put in the void. That would have been far more interesting, far more inspired. I guess they're just going off her direction in the first place. So there you have it, another <laughs> three episodes <laughs> of Laura Olympus in this week's video. A very special video. Yeah. Where um, we broke down the crime scene interrogation footage. I mean, I, I we just wanted to like dedicate some time to kind of establish why we were saying those things and the way we interpreted it because there's a really kind of big thing here. Like, I think the, the main utility of, of the videos is um, not only talking about the ways in which it could have been better, but it's sort of like a cautionary tale for aspiring writers as to how you, your audience or, or people, not even your target demographic audience, can interpret things if the writing is not clear and if the setup is not executed well. And that's extremely important because the last thing you want to do is write something that you think is salient and makes sense and is portraying a character in a way that you want them to be portrayed, specifically if it's like a, a sympathetic sort of portrayal, yep. uh, only to have them come across in a way that has two people sitting on a sofa comparing them to Ed Kemper or yeah. Ted Bundy. Right. <laughs> you don't want that. Right. <laughs> so, uh, we wanted to be, like, really thorough in articulating what specific parts of, of the narrative were making us feel that way towards Persephone in yep. her description of her act of wrath. So hopefully that was enlightening <clears throat> uh, for you guys in this episode. Um, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I hope that didn't come across as, like, too nitpicky or too unfair or too uncharitable. Like, on the one hand, like, half of the stuff that we say is, like, us just, like, joking about Laura Olympus. Obviously, we don't take this very seriously, um, as we keep saying. Um, and it's, like, where we can make a joke, we will make a joke. But I, at, at the end of the day, I do think that Persephone comes across as very manipulative. And it's very, like, weird and sinister that there's, like, that big 24-hour chunk of time missing. She intentionally goes missing right before the act of wrath is revealed and the arrest warrant comes out. And... Because she went missing, Hades is willing to forgive all of it and let her live in his house, where if, if it had been revealed before, like, say, during the workday when she was working for him, that she had committed treason, she had hidden all these it, this influx of souls into the underworld, and um, she knew that she'd met him the entire time, it didn't say anything, like, all those things stacking up, it would have looked so much worse for her, and it would have painted her in a much less sympathetic light. So yeah, I know it's completely unintentional. I wouldn't be sitting here, you know, I'd probably be calling Laura Olympus genius if it was intentional that she was supposed to be like a psycho killer yeah. or like super manipulative and sociopathic. Um, but we all know it's unintentional. Um, and we're just pointing out the fact that, yeah, it's unintentional, but look at how it comes across because of the way that it's framed, because of the fact that she has no internal monologue, because of the, t the fact that the timeline got screwed and we're missing like 24 hours that goes completely unaccounted for. You know, um, and then the fact that she didn't want to spend time on the interrogation and the fallout and the angst. So she just cuts to Persephone acting really childish and, and in fact, much more childish and goofy and zany than Hades was, Hades was in that scene. Yeah. You know, immediately after confessing her act of genocide. So it's just like, oh, and the fact that she doesn't contradict any of the facts either. Just says, oh, but I was crying when it happened. And let me give you all this sad Naruto backstory so you know why I did it. Yeah. Basically, like, a serial killer defense. You know, I was abused by my parents or whatever. Yeah. So I think to me, like, these three episodes, uh, it sh what should be, like, a satisfying, now we're getting all the answers, now we get to hear her side of things, now we have to pick up the pieces, uh, what should have been satisfying if this were executed well is just kind of a cautionary tale. Uh, for those of you who maybe you want to tell your own stories, if you like doing fluff, don't feel pressured to put high stakes drama into a story if you don't enjoy writing that stuff. And if you aren't 100% sure that you can stick the landing, uh, I would I would never do that. I mean, I wouldn't touch some of the, the topics in this um, comic with a 10 foot pole yeah. because I don't think I could do them justice. Um, especially like the sensitive topics, I just would not write me personally just because um, I know it would be very difficult to make the story satisfying afterwards, especially if you have to work on something for such a long period of time and what you were initially having a lot of fun with doing 
was the lighthearted, aesthetically pleasing, fluffy interactions between two characters with low stakes drama. Uh, so just, yeah, don't feel pressured to put something out there that is like super serious and stuff. I mean, people will enjoy stuff and, and like it if you, like if, if it's clear that the author enjoys it and likes it and is having fun with it, right? And I think uh, one of the things that people are noticing now in the later episodes is that the passion um, in a lot of and the effort, yeah. yeah, the effort has kind of been dialed down, and it's it's not it's like it's like sad to see when when an artist is no longer enjoying their work mm -hmm. and when they're like sick and tired of it, <laughs> but they gotta keep they gotta keep a face on because they signed a blood contract. Yeah, they signed a contract <laughs> with Webtoon, so yeah, I mean. Um, I think Rachel even said there should not be like a stigma around quitting stuff that you don't want to do anymore. Yeah. And I agree with that. I think if if you're going to have to do something that you have to do for multiple years, you better make sure that you enjoy doing it. Otherwise, it's it's going to come through in the work that you're not having a good time. Yeah. So, um, I think what would have helped her um, significantly and, and helped her with the burnout is having a plan, a detailed plan if she wanted the story to get serious have all those pieces in place, have a plan for the reveal. Um, because it feels like the reason she's getting burned out is because of the psychic weight of having to come up with the new plot every week and, and being worried about whether it gels with the old plot, you know, and it doesn't. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say about the Act of Wrath, to go back to what you were saying about how it should have been satisfying, but it wasn't, not only did it not answer any questions, but it also rings far more hollow than the Act of Wrath that we saw at the end of 115. Like, to the point that if you see it, it feels like she's lying. Yeah. Like, it doesn't feel like the true, actual events of the Act of Wrath. Yeah, especially because she's talking about a feeling that we've never seen before. And you can't even say, like, it would be a stretch from the audience to say, like, oh, well, that one time she was talking to herself in the mirror, that version of Persephone that she saw in the mirror, that was the feeling. She no. did set it up before. That's... Or the dream. No. The closest thing that comes to it, to foreshadowing it, is the dream. But that was, like, a hundred episodes ago. And you even said on her Patreon she confirmed it to be Hades. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, yep. the setup just wasn't there. So it's like, if you didn't set it up correctly, why then would you try and go and basically retcon, you know, what you had already written in the story? I didn't think that there was anything wrong with the initial act of Wrath. I thought the tone was a little off, because, like, in the violent scenes, it looked, like it, it looked like it was rendered comedically. Yeah. But there was nothing wrong with having that be the act of Wrath if you were going to deal with it and actually give Persephone some flaws. And I think that's, like, ultimately what's lacking here. It's, like, not only the, the, the lack of planning, but also the fact that she doesn't want to give Persephone any flaws. And so she's basically retconned the act of Wrath so that Persephone was not actually involved with it at all. And it was never her fault. Yeah, I think it would have been more interesting if Persephone was, like, she tried to maintain a facade of being, like, a bubbly person. You know, you have Artemis saying, oh, I thought she was okay. She always seems so happy. I didn't think there was anything wrong with her. But deep down inside, she's got temperamental issues. And she can go off just like that. Because she bottles up her emotions. Yeah, she tries to bottle up her emotions and pretend nothing is wrong because... She has always been raised to be prim and proper, and she's very worried about how she comes across to other mm -hmm. people. But you have things directly contradicting that, where she says, well, I don't care what the paparazzi says about me because it's not true. But then she says, everybody's going to think I'm a stupid village girl, mm -hmm. right? So with what you had already set up in the story, I think it's it's more interesting, it's more consistent to have the act of Wrath go down as it had originally. So yeah. I, I was really disappointed to see her version of the truth, unless... She is making all of that. She's a sociopathic. <laughs> Which case, that's more interesting. Sociopathic liar. Yeah. Habitual liar. Yeah. So, um, as always, we hope that the discussion was interesting for you guys. Um, like and subscribe if you haven't already. We're going to have uh, videos coming out about other things, right? Like, we're thinking of talking about some movies, as we mentioned in the previous video. Um, but we're, we're going to try to stick with Laura Olympus, and we'll try to get at least three episodes done no i think the three episodes is like a special case because it was yeah. such a pivotal moment in the series i think we'll try to do five plus episodes and uh we'll try to hurry it along and like i don't know just tr I, I i guess because you guys do like the level of detail that we go to but i also don't want to be doing lore olympus for like an entire year so yeah. uh i think we'll try to do at least five episodes this one is a special case if we get to another special case like the chronos battle yeah where it's like oh dude everything that went wrong went you know everything that could have gone wrong went wrong you yeah know? that would be a great opportunity for like how it could have been better but i mean there's like only so much you can say going panel by panel before it becomes kind of repetitive, repetitive. and nitpicky where you're getting into stuff where it's like 
why does the baby look like that? <laughs> yeah, I like, know, and I think this time the art discussion was kind of lessened. I think yeah. where we did discuss the art, it was more about composition. Yeah. And then that freaky panel where everything was doubled. Yeah. And then, like, that one weird panel where Hades looked like a Spongebob meme. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, at this point, we all know that the art is nowhere near as good as it was before. I think where I would stop and point out the art is where you can, build, you can say, like, oh, this visual would have been so much better, or this composition would have been so much better. Yeah. The things that really matter are, are the story beats, like the timeline, inconsistencies, and then the character motivations. So. And then when the visuals directly contradict what's being said, <laughs> which does a happen a yeah. lot. So, all right, well, another three episodes in the bag. Another... We're going to pick up with uh, episode 134 next time. Yeah, 134. We'll, we'll probably try to do 134 to 140. Yeah, it'll be, we'll, no promises, but we'll try to get an even number. Six, yeah. Yeah, we'll try to get an even number. We'll try there. to end on 140, so then we can do 141 to 145 yeah. after that. Yeah. Because I, I think it's just like the Zoom call, and like not that much happens. Yeah. But anyway. All right, well, we'll see you guys next time. Same couch. Same lure Olympus, <laughs> different outfits, same channel, same two people talking about it. Yes, yes. All right, bye.